Well, hey, good morning, everyone. We hope you found the refreshments over in the lobby. Um, I made a bit of a tactical error. Uh, we were planning on keeping this room food free. Don't be upset at yourselves. Be upset at me. That's okay. Uh, all of you who have plates of food, you're grandfathered in to the rule. Um, but if you spill anything, Diana has said she's going to sick Robert on you, and he does high-level martial arts. So uh, the reason that I say that is because at 2 o'clock, we have a hard cutoff in this room, and we're at 4 o'clock, we have our first service. So we want to go easy on the facilities team as much as possible. So any food trash, uh, when we're done, if there's any residue or anything, let's take that out to the you know, hallway trash cans or outside and do our best to make it look like we're ghosts in here afterwards, like we were never here. That would be very, very helpful for our, uh, our turnover team. Um, well, we're, we're glad that you are all here. I also made another tactical error. This is a good, a good you all know what I'm going to say, um, but this is a good place for me to say that I've never claimed to be uh, infallible sitting ex cathedra. So when I was making pronouncements from the stage as a, an elder of Redeemer Bible Church, I said 830, which you're all here, and I'm so thankful. Uh, but many of our, our people may not be. And so what we've decided to do, instead of just hang out for a half an hour and, and, and waste Mike's time of, of where we could be engaging with him, we're going to just do an informal Q&A until 9. So... Uh, for those of you who are here and you might have kind of off-the-cuff questions or things that you want to address from last night, I'm going to run around like a chicken with my head cut off with a microphone. So if you raise your hand, I'll hand you the microphone. You can ask the question, return the microphone to me. You don't get to keep it, okay? You don't get to keep it. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll just do that until about 9 o'clock, okay? Uh, so does anybody have any questions? Anybody would like to ask? Good, an easy person to access right away. Say your name as well. Hi, I'm Evelyn. Um, how would you, what's a good talking point, because I've heard that they've split the, or they've removed one of the Ten Commandments, which is the don't worship idols. So can you just help me, I don't know, navigate that? Yes, Evelyn, I'm glad you asked that, because the Roman Catholic Bible still has the Ten Commandments as God gave them to Moses, but it's the Catholic Catechism that changed the Ten Commandments. They removed the Second Commandment, and there's a good reason why they m removed it. Thou shalt not worship anything in the heavens above, the earth below, or the waters beneath, or bow down and worship them. They shall not create images of anything in the heavens above. And so if you go in any Catholic bookstore, you can see that icons and images and statues are big business. And so they removed it from the catechism. And what they did is they took the Tenth Commandment and divided it into two, thou shalt not covet. So it's correct in the Bible, incorrect in the catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, my name is Sharon Wakeley from Prescott, Arizona. <laughs> Long drive down. Uh, so glad to be here. Um, I hear all the time that many Catholics are truly Christians even though they follow all the Catholic dogmas and rituals. Is, is that a... Yes, Sharon, that's a, a question that I often ask when I engage strangers. I just say, are you a Christian? And Catholics will respond, no, I'm a Catholic. And so they see the distinction between the two. Most of them do. And then I also hear oftentimes, well, I know a Catholic who is truly saved, and I'll say, how do you know? And they'll say, because they love Jesus. And then I'll say, which Jesus do they love? And so that's the first message this morning at 9 o'clock. Catholics have another Jesus. They deny the sufficiency of our Lord Jesus. So you will see that the Jesus of the Catholic Church is an imposter. He's a counterfeit Christ. And he's not the Jesus that's gloriously revealed in Scripture. So whenever anybody says, I know someone who's saved because they believe in Jesus, the Apostle Paul said, some will come and preach another Jesus. The Mormons have another Jesus. The Muslims have another Jesus. And yes, the Catholics have another Jesus as well. My name is Joanne Noel. Um, I have a question that might be on the, line, on the minds of many people who deal with Catholic relatives. Is there a time when it would seem appropriate to back off for a while and... and leave them alone because they're, they're getting um, 
insulting and, and rejecting and various sure. things. Yes, Joanne, I wished I had a seminar such as this before I went home to my Catholic family. In fact, in the second message this morning, I'll be sharing with you how to evangelize Catholics God's way. But when the Lord saved me at age 35, I could not wait for a Christmas vacation to go home and share the good news with my three brothers and sister and my parents. I really thought when they heard the good news, they would believe it just as I did. But I did it all the wrong way. I pretty much backed the theological dump truck and let them have it all at one time. <laughs> and they were just reeling backwards. And the walls quickly went up. And they said, Mike, if we ever want to know anything else about your newfound religion, we'll ask you, but we don't want to hear anything else. And I said, but I don't have a religion anymore. I exchanged it for a relationship with Christ. Whatever, I don't want to hear anything about it. So I did it the wrong way. And I think we need to be sensitive. In fact, one of the best ways that we witness, we'll hear in the second message, we need to ask questions. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ ministered the gospel for three and a half years, do you know how many questions he asked? Over 330 questions. And so if we're going to emulate the greatest evangelist of all time, the Lord Jesus, he was perfect in his method, we need to ask questions. Um, unbelievers do not want to be preached at. And I think you'll, you'll find that out if you, if you do that. But by asking questions, you can find out more about where they're coming from spiritually. You know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And the best way you can show them that you care for them is to ask questions. And so we, we simply ask questions like, what are you trusting to get to heaven? And listen to their answer. If they don't talk about Jesus, and rarely do Catholics talk about Jesus, it's all about what they do. You can simply say, if, if that weren't true, according to the one who created heaven, would you want to know the truth from his word? And see if there's an open opportunity to open the Bible and sit down and share the gospel with them. But asking questions is very effective as we witness. Hi, my name is Austin Holman. Uh, thank you, Mike, for uh, being here today. Um, I just wanted to ask, I, I work at a ministry with a lot of Catholics, and I was wondering, um, faith isn't something we generally talk about just day to day, but how to start those conversations uh, and bring up faith with, with Catholics. Sure. Um, everybody has faith. I hope you all realize that. The key is, what is the object of your faith? In Roman Catholicism, I can speak from personal experience, and I'm sure many former Catholics would agree, your faith was never in Christ. Your faith was in your religion. Your faith was in the priesthood. They were the dispensers of salvation, dispensers of grace. And so you ultimately trusted the priest and you t trusted your religion to be a vehicle that would get you to heaven. So the key question then is, what is the object of your faith? Because the only way that you can get to heaven is by repenting and believing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you can point to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4, where Paul defines the gospel. He says it is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to what? According to Scripture. And so the gospel speaks of nothing other than Christ. Peter said there is no other name given among men by which we are to be saved. Paul said there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So if you want to know how you can have assurance of going to heaven, you put all of your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can never do what Christ has done. And unfortunately, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that you must do things to appease a holy and righteous God. Catholicism, by the way, is no different from any other religion in the world. Every religion in the world preaches a works righteousness salvation. Biblical Christianity is set apart. We worship and trust an all-sufficient Savior. And so salvation is offered by grace because Christ did it all. But the religions of the world say, no, you must do things to appease a holy and righteous God. The Jesus of the Catholic Church merely opened the gates of heaven. Catholics must now do their part to get through those gates. 
And so the object of their faith is of utmost importance. If I don't see any hands, we Over have... here? <clears throat> okay, hang on one sec. Sorry. Hi, my name is Christine. I was wondering if you can explain how the cat Roman I was used to be Roman Catholic uh, until I read the Bible in my twenties and my eyes were open. But I, uh, on the subject of celibacy, do you know why they wanted to go that route? Because I heard that that was one of the reasons uh, they wanted to keep the wealth in the Roman Catholic Church. So. Yes, Christine, all you have to do is follow the money. <laughs> yep. See, Roman Catholic priests and bishops were getting very rich through the sale of indulgences. And so when they died, the money stayed in the family. And so the best way to overcome that is to not allow the priest to marry and have children and have families so the money would go back to the Catholic religion. So how do we reconcile Catholics who don't agree with what the Pope says currently and yet still call themselves Catholic? Sure. And there are many... His Catholic name is Trevor, by the way. Thanks, Trevor. Yes. <laughs> Yes, Trevor. Um, many Catholics are up in the air about what to do with Pope Francis, because as I shared last night, he not only misrepresents the Bible, he misrepresents historic Roman Catholicism. And so one of the things I say is that if my pastor said the things Pope Francis is saying, I would get up and leave that church so quickly. Why do you remain in a church where the head of the church is so corrupt? He doesn't know the Bible. He doesn't know anything about spiritual truth. He's misleading people. He's shutting the gates of heaven in the faces of those who want to enter with a false and fatal gospel. So why would you continue in a church that's corrupt from the top down? Just ask the question. Mike. Uh, yes. I, I'm Jack, and uh, I was a Jesuit for six and a half years. And uh, it was the biggest mistake of my life. I entered at 18, and at, uh, t at uh, age 22, from, in 1962, I entered in 1956. So I'm a, I'm a year younger than this pope. He entered in the novitiate in Argentina. I entered in the novitiate in Los Gatos, California. And uh, I, uh, after six and a half years and wearing out the dark confessional box and confessing the same sins over and over, and, and, and I hear this voice through the, the dark curtain saying, this is not what the confessional is meant for. I go to my room and I didn't talk to anybody anymore. You can't hide out in a Jesuit monastery very long if somebody misses you. So they took me off to Portland, Oregon, to uh, a hospital that had electroshock therapy to my brain. Mm. And, uh, but I was, I was released and got out of there. And uh, I went back to, uh, to the Brophy campus where I had been valedictorian in my class. I was supposed to be a smart guy. And uh, the guy who witnessed my resignation of my vows, it's a big long thing in Latin. You had to sign, resign your name about uh, 10 times. And then I walked off that campus with my tail behind my back thinking I failed. I let my parents, my brothers, my, all, all, I let the nuns that taught me, the priests that taught me, and it's just a bunch of el crapo crapo, and you know what I'm talking about. I, 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 I love to hear you talk about your uncle, because I had an uncle, my mother's brother, went to Mount Carmel High School in 1924, he graduated, he was a sophomore, in, in Chicago, and he told my grandparents, his, his parents, that he thought he had a vocation to the Carmelite Monastery in Buffalo, New York. He goes there, and he's molested by a homosexual priest. Hmm. And he said at that point, piss on the Roman Catholic Church. But you know what I'm saying is that I have to forgive these people, and that's the bottom line today, because I've moved on with my life. I'm, 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 I'm here with my pastor, Dan Confessi, of Sovereign Grace Bible Church today, and, 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 and he's very gracious to get me over here. 
I, I've been blessed by the Lord in so many, many ways. And I, and I love, I let you, love what you say, I love individual Catholic people. I just detest the system that keeps them in bondage. Amen. Amen. Yeah, praise God for delivering you out of darkness and setting you free from religious deception. Praise mm -hmm. God. <clears throat> Anything else? Hi, um, I'm Tony, uh, and I was just curious uh, because I know that uh, if you're in a Roman Catholic uh, family, you know, if you turn away from that, it can lead to a lot of like ostracization from like your family and friends and stuff. So if you do manage to, you know, get someone to come to Christ, you know, how would you help someone out if they're, you know, help them go through some of the, you know, um, stigma that would come with from their family, uh, you know, turning away from the Catholic Church? Yeah, Tony. Boy, that's so prevalent. There's such a strong family and culture tie to Roman Catholicism. And oftentimes people are fearful of leaving the Catholic religion because they would be ostracized by their family. And I can testify that that's what happened to me when I left the Catholic Church. My family had nothing to do with me anymore. There was a opportunity I had in a um, small church in Kansas. They had been praying for a young man who is a devout Catholic for three years. His wife found out I was coming to do a weekend seminar, and she pleaded with her husband, please come and hear this former Catholic. And so he came that Saturday night, and I, I gave a message on where will you spend eternity. And I made the gospel very clear about the sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so afterwards, I, I walked, walked out of the pulpit, and she comes up and introduces me to her Catholic husband. And I looked him right in the eyes, and I said, based on what you've just heard from God's word, what is keeping you from trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as your all-sufficient Savior right now? And he just looked like a deer in the headlights. Didn't say a word. I wasn't going to say another word till he answered. And finally, about a minute went by, and his wife blurts out, It's your parents. You don't want to offend your parents. <laughs> and he said, You know what? She's right. I don't want to offend my parents. And so I took him to Matthew, where Jesus said, I came to divide father against son and mother against daughter. I said, do you love Jesus more than you love your parents? And I gave him a couple of gospel tracts. I said, please read these tonight. Come back tomorrow morning for the Sunday morning message, and we'll talk some more. So the next morning, he and his wife were the first ones in the church. And he said, I couldn't sleep at all last night. I read what you gave me. In the middle of the night, I cried out to the Lord to save me. And then I couldn't wait for my wife to wake up. And we sat on the side of the bed, and I apologized to her for every time she invited me to church. I bit her head off and got very angry at her. I said, I'm so sorry. I trusted the Lord during the night. And, of course, tears of joy are streaming down our cheeks as we see that the Word of God had an impact as the Spirit of God broad conviction and illumination. And so that is an issue that a lot of people have to face, and we have to address that. Do you love the Lord Jesus more than you love anything else, including your parents and your family? And take them to those passages where Jesus came to divide. By the way, I don't know if you have ever considered this. I can't think of anything else other than truth that both unites and divides. If you think of anything, let me know. But in the high priestly prayer, Jesus prayed that they would be sanctified in the truth, that we would all be one in Christ based on the truth of God's word. But then we see Jesus, the personification of truth, he came to divide. And that's what the gospel does. It divides the believing world from the unbelieving world. So, we need to address that as we're witnessing to those who are trapped in Roman Catholic culture and Roman Catholic families. Mike, how would you address um, professing evangelicals that say Vatican II fixed a whole lot of things? The only thing Vatican Council II did was change the church cosmetically. 
They turn, they turn the altar around for the priest to face the people. They no longer did the mass in Latin, but then in the common vernacular. A lot of cosmetic changes. But as I shared last night, there's a difference between a teaching doctrine of the Catholic Church and a dogma. Dogmas are infallible pronouncements. By the very nature of an infallible dogma, it can never change. Because if you change one infallible dogma, the whole system collapses on itself. And so the dogmas of the Catholic Church will never change. And that's the, that's the answer to the question. It changed cosmetically, but not dogmatically. Hi, my name is Rosa. Um, my question is, ever since I was little, I remember, and growing up as Catholic, I remember questioning my parents all the time. And I was constantly told, you're not supposed to question the Catholic Church. And I still get that response. So what is your answer to that? Well, the answer is found in Acts 17.11, where Paul was preaching in the synagogues of Berea. And as he was preaching, his listeners were searching the scriptures daily to find out if Paul was teaching them the truth. And so that means if an apostle comes under the scrutiny of scripture, every person that is in the clergy of the Catholic Church needs to come under the same scrutiny. We need to test every man's teaching by the authority of God's word. If it conforms to God's word, we receive it and believe it. If it goes against God's word, we reject it. Okay? By the way, a continuation on Vatican II, one of the major changes was we used to be called heretics prior to Vatican II, but Vatican II issued the decree on ecumenism. The only way they can woo us back home to Rome is to change our name from heretic to separated brethren. And so now the Catholic Church says that you need to come back home to Rome for the fullness of salvation. And what we are lacking, according to the Catholic Church, is the Eucharist. We cannot have the fullness of salvation till we come back home to Rome. And by the way, Roman Catholic priests are always willing to sit down and talk with me now because that's their goal, to bring separated brethren back home. And when they tell me I don't have the fullness of salvation without the Eucharist, I say, in Christ, I have the complete forgiveness of sins. And according to your catechism, you don't. In Christ, I have the assurance of eternal life, and according to your catechism, you don't. You only have conditional life. And in Christ, I have the empowering Holy Spirit to give me the opportunity to live victorious over sin, and according to your catechism, you don't. So you need to leave the Eucharist, and you need to come to the true Christ, and only then can you receive the fullness of salvation. Mike, we have about two minutes left. We'll get started in the session right after this question. Um, you can, uh, when we're done, you can switch over to your computer, lead us in prayer, get us going. Uh, but but uh, just, and we'll have more time for questions at the end. Just so you know, you can continue to submit those through that QR code. Uh, continuing on the question of the Eucharist, um, many Catholics will say, well, the Bible says, if, if you do not eat my body and drink my blood, uh, so can you speak a little bit to that argument when, when they describe transubstantiation as being necessary uh, in the Eucharist? And you want me to do that in two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Take an hour if you like, or if it's built in there somewhere, you know. But that, that's a common objection yeah. that I hear. Well, there's several things we can say to Roman Catholics. In John 6, what has just taken place? Jesus has just fed the multitudes physical food. So then he crosses the Sea of Galilee and they all follow him because they want another free lunch. And so in John chapter 6, Jesus is no longer talking about physical food. He's now talking about spiritual nourishment. And he calls himself the bread of life, contrasting the manna that came down during the time of Moses. He is now the bread of life for spiritual nourishment. And so Jesus is clearly speaking figuratively. In fact, in John chapter 6, toward the end of the chapter, he says, the words I have spoken to you are spirit. The flesh counts for nothing. Um, if you look at verse 40 of John chapter 6 and verse 54, 
you will see that in verse 40, whoever beholds and believes in Jesus has eternal life and will be raised on the last day. Verse 54 says, whoever eats my body and drinks my blood has eternal life and will be raised on the last day. So both verses give the promise of eternal life and resurrection on the last day. So you ask Catholics, what if you behold and believe, but you don't eat and drink? Do you have eternal life? Or what if you eat and drink, but you don't behold and believe? Do you have eternal life? The only way you can reconcile those two verses is to take one figuratively and one literally. Clearly, Jesus is speaking of spiritual nourishment. Take me in, I will abide in you, and I will offer you eternal life and resurrection by beholding and believing in me. Um, Jesus was obviously speaking to unbelievers. We see that in John 6. Whenever Jesus spoke to a mixed crowd of believers and unbelievers, he spoke in parables, figurative language. And then in the end, when the unbelievers left, Jesus asked the apostles, are you going to leave too? What was Peter's response? No, Lord, you have the flesh of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. Jesus was speaking words that would bring spiritual nourishment to them. So it's an important verse. Um, the whole passage is important, but you also need to tell Catholics, this happened over a year and a half before the crucifixion. What did people do for the next year and a half? Did they gnaw on the body of Jesus? Did they drink his blood while he was still alive? Clearly, Jesus is speaking figuratively, but yet the whole doctrine of transubstantiation rests on how you interpret John 6. Okay? So, let's begin our time at the throne of grace, shall we? Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to once again open your word and to see the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we are thankful that you did not leave us in our hopeless and helpless condition, condemned to death, but you sent us a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who did everything necessary to save us completely and forever. And Father, it's our heart's desire that we would be better equipped today to effectively reach out to this huge mission field made up of 1.3 billion Roman Catholics. Father, we recognize that many of our family members are still trapped in religious deception. We know only the truth of your word would set them free. So we pray that we would be able to take them to the scriptures that would do just that. We ask this for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of his name. Amen. So if you remember last night, I shared with you the two most important principles to share as you witness to Roman Catholics. The first one was we need to establish the supreme authority of God's word. And the second most important principle, we need to establish the sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to share with you the importance of the first principle. While I was... Um, I guess it was probably seven or eight years after I graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary. I got two emails from two different students at Dallas Seminary with basically the same question. And I just want to read their emails to you to show you the importance of establishing Scripture as the supreme authority. Dear Mr. Gendron, I enrolled at DTS to find answers and prove the Catholic Church wrong. After a semester of talking to professors, not a single one could give me an answer to the issue of authority. What good is an infallible book without an infallible living authority to interpret it? I finally went to what the Catholic Church has taught consistently for 2,000 years and realized that the James Whites, R.C. Sprouls, and Mike Gendrons were spreading utter lies about Catholicism. So now I've decided to join the Catholic Church Sola Scriptura is a Protestant tradition and an idolatrous worship of man's authority over Christ. Theological debate is of no use. The Catholic Church wins every argument by their claim 
to a historical, provable, transmitted authority given them from the apostles. Christ left us with an authority structure in the Catholic Church as the only way to stay true to his word. And then the next email, this was about three or four months later, another DTS student. I was an evangelical for the first 28 years of my life, went to DTS and recently became a Catholic. I go to mass, pray the rosary, wear the brown scapula and pray to Mary, all as extensions of my faith in Jesus Christ. I have read your book, Preparing Catholics for Eternity, and the doctrinal differences we have boils down to authority. If the Bible is our sole authority when it comes to the gospel, why wasn't this taught for the first 1,500 years of the church? So as I interacted with these two students over a three-month period, I warned them that they were headed into apostasy by joining the Roman Catholic Church. It was discouraging to see them ultimately leave and join the Catholic Church. But when this happens, we have to recognize that Jesus Christ is purifying his church. The wannabes and the pretenders of being Christian are leaving and joining the apostate religion. And so even though I shared a lot of God's word, we know it never returns void. It brings salvation to those who believe it, but further condemnation for those who reject it. So I just wanted to share that with you as um, a reason why we need to establish the Bible as the supreme authority. Remember, the Bible is what God says. Religion is what man says God says. We can direct people directly to the source for truth. So two years ago, Legionnaire Ministry constructed a survey of 3,000 Americans to examine the state of theology in our country. 30% of evangelicals reject the deity of Christ. 25% believe that God counts a person as righteous because of one's works, not because of one's faith in Jesus Christ. So never before has there been such a need to preach the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ as he is gloriously revealed in Scripture. The greatest attack on the Christian faith today is on the sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ and the exclusivity of his gospel. There are many who say they believe in Jesus Christ today, but say he's not enough. It has to be Christ plus good works, plus sacraments, or plus keeping the law. They do not realize that they are insulting the Lord Jesus Christ by adding to his perfect, all-sufficient work of redemption. Clearly, they have not studied their Bible to know the true Jesus. Everything from Matthew to Revelation reveals the sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ for everyone who would bother to read and study the truth of God's word. So that's what we're going to do in the next hour. We're going to look at the Christ of the gospel. He is the eternal Son of God, the all-sufficient Savior, he is Savior, prophet, priest, and king. He is the one mediator between God and man, and he is the only head of his church. The only hope for sinners is the Lord Jesus Christ. He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. He lived a sinless life of perfect obedience, then died as a substitute for sinners, canceling the eternal sin debt for those who repent and believe his gospel. No one will ever appreciate what the Lord Jesus Christ has done until they realize how utterly hopeless and helpless they are to do anything about it. No one will seek a Savior until they know they are destined for the torments of hell. No one will seek to be reconciled to God until they know they have been separated from him by their sin. No one will seek a substitute to die in their place until they know they are condemned to death. No one can receive the righteousness of Christ as a gift until they are first stripped of their own righteousness. No one will try to get on the narrow road that leads to life until they know they are on the broad way that leads to destruction. No one can be saved until they recognize the sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ, which will lead to them to repentance and faith repentance of doing all the things they can do 
and putting all their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we need to preach the law to show people they are condemned. They are on death row, and their only hope is to find a substitute. And the only one qualified is the sinless, eternal Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right before the Lord Jesus gave up his spirit, he cried out, it is finished. The victory cry, to die. It is finished, speaks volumes of everything Christ did to save us. Prophecy was fulfilled. Righteousness was perfected. Jesus lived a sinless life, obeying the law perfectly. Substitution was offered. Please don't miss this. Penal substitution is never, ever taught in the Roman Catholic religion. As a Roman Catholic, I was taught for 35 years that Jesus died for the sins of the world. That's history. When I found out Jesus died for me as a substitute, that was salvation. Catholics do not know the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Divine justice was satisfied by Christ. Blood was shed. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Redemption was paid, and the price of our redemption was the precious blood of Jesus. He redeemed us from the slave market of sin. Sins were forgiven. Reconciliation was achieved. Death was conquered, and salvation was secured. The sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ is summed up in his victory cry, it is finished. The work of redemption the Father had given him was accomplished. Everything necessary to save sinners was completed. We can only wonder how professing Christians can insult the Lord Jesus Christ by adding their filthy rags of righteousness to his perfect, all-sufficient work of redemption. Substitution was offered by the Lord Jesus Christ. The innocent Son of God stood in the place of guilty sinners and bore the righteous wrath of God for the sins of his people so that the guilty could be forgiven and declared righteous. We see the substitutionary atonement of Christ so clearly presented in Isaiah 53. My favorite verse in all of Scripture is 2 Corinthians 5.21. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I consider that the greatest exchange in human history. By faith, Christ takes all of my guilt, all of my sin, all of my punishment. He was immersed in the wrath of God. And what does he give me in return? His perfect righteousness. There are two things that keep people out of heaven. Number one, they have an eternal sin debt that can never be paid by finite man. The eternal Son of God had to come and cancel it. And number two, God's righteousness requires perfect righteousness for entrance into heaven. Once we sin, we can never be perfectly righteous again. I played baseball for the Raging Cajuns in Louisiana. I remember always the first game of the season when I caught my first ball. I was fielding a perfect 1,000%. It was only a matter of time where I committed an error and my fielding percentage dropped below 1,000. It didn't matter if I caught every ball the rest of the year, I could never again obtain a perfect fielding percentage. And so it is when we sin. We can never obtain the perfect righteousness God's righteousness requires. But God took care of that. He said, if you trust in the only righteous one, I will give you his righteousness as a gift Romans 5, 17. That's our passport into heaven. That is the only way we can get into heaven. And because 2 Corinthians 5, 21 is my favorite verse, we have t-shirts back there that speak of 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And I say it is the greatest news anyone could ever hear. My sin for his righteousness. It's a great conversation starter. So why did Jesus have to die? In the next hour, I'm going to share with you effective ways to witness, and this is one of the ways. Ask people questions. I can't tell you how many professing Christians, whether it be Catholic or Christian, do not know the answer to this. 
When you ask that question, you may hear people say, because he loved us. Well, that was his motivation for dying, but it doesn't answer the question, why did Jesus have to die? Some will say, because of our sin. And I will say, why did he have to die for our sin? It's amazing how few people know. The wages of sin is death. The reason Jesus went to the cross to die was to pay the punishment that you and I deserve. He had to satisfy divine justice. God provided a sinless substitute to die the death that sinners deserve. Jesus bore the sins of his people and was crushed for their iniquities. All the righteous demands of the law were upheld so that believers could be acquitted. Salvation was secured by the Lord Jesus Christ. This is so important to share with Roman Catholics. Oftentimes, I'll go directly to 1 John 5.13, where John writes to those who believe in the name of the Son of God that you can know right here and now that you have in your possession eternal, everlasting life. Catholics don't have that. They only have conditional life. But to every believer, the Good Shepherd says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. The Lord Jesus protects his flock and he loses not one. Salvation is secured by the power and the very promises of Almighty God. Listen to the words of Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the very power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5. What encouraging words to share. Our inheritance is protected by the power of Almighty God, there is no greater power. And we know that God can never, ever break his promise. The victory cry of Jesus to Telestai, the curtain of the temple was torn open from top to bottom, showing that now through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we have direct access to the Father. We no longer need priests offering sacrifices that can never take away sin. Direct access to the Father through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's why the veil was torn open. But yet Roman Catholicism is a continuation of Judaism. They have a sacerdotal priesthood that continues to offer sacrifices that can never take away sin. We need to share with Catholics, the veil has been torn open. You no longer need priest because Jesus Christ, the perfect high priest, offered himself the perfect sacrifice to a perfect God who demands perfection. And then he cried out, it is finished. Roman Catholics are utterly dependent upon their priests. Listen to how many ways they depend on their priesthood. It is the priest who baptizes them for regeneration and justification. This is amazing, isn't it? Oftentimes, it's a seven-day-old infant who has no capacity to believe in anything, and yet they are said to be justified. I had a long conversation with a Roman Catholic who was in seminary to become a priest, and I asked him this question. How can water baptism justify an infant when they cannot put their faith in anything? Clearly, the Bible preaches justification by faith. He said, well, it's not the faith of the infant, it's the faith of their parents. Oh, so God has grandchildren? You can get to heaven on the faith of your parents? He started to do a little bit of gobbledygook and throw smoke and mirrors around Obviously, he could not answer the question. Also, it's the sacrament of regeneration. They are said to be born again by the efficacious waters of baptism. It's the priest who hears confession and absolves sin. 
It is the priest who offers the body and blood of Jesus in the Eucharist. It's the priest who imparts the Holy Spirit in the sacrament of confirmation. If you grew up Catholic, you know that at one point you knelt before a bishop or a cardinal. He slapped you on the cheek, and at that very moment, you were said to receive the Holy Spirit. Interesting, isn't it? Because water baptism is the sacrament of regeneration. You would think you'd get the Spirit then, but 13 years later, here he comes again. It's the priest who gives last rites. Some of you are old enough, as I am, to remember the assassination of JFK. They would not pronounce him dead until the priest had the opportunity to administer last rites. This is supposed to prepare them for their journey into eternity. And even after a Catholic is dead, they still rely on the Roman Catholic priesthood to offer the Mass for the souls suffering in purgatory. So the question comes up as we witness to Roman Catholics, which Jesus do you trust? The true Jesus provides eternal, everlasting life. The Catholic Jesus provides only conditional life. The true Jesus provides the complete forgiveness of all sin. The Catholic Jesus provides only partial forgiveness. You may remember when John Paul II died, even though they referred to him as Holy Father, they had eight different Roman Catholic cardinals fly into the Vatican to offer the sacrifice of the Mass to get the Holy Father out of purgatory because they believe he died with residual sin that had to be purified purified. The true Jesus provides a permanent right standing before God. Hebrews 10.14 is a favorite verse of mine to share with Catholics. By one offering, he has made perfect forever those who are being sanctified. Can you improve on the perfect righteousness of Christ? And how long do you have it? Forever. But the Catholic Jesus provides only a continuous striving to gain God's acceptance. You know what I'm talking about. It's like being on a treadmill, always doing the best you can to appease a holy and righteous God, but going nowhere. The true Jesus provides peace, joy, and absolute assurance of eternal life, whereas the Catholic Jesus provides uncertainty, fear, and doubt. When I was still in the corporate world as a Roman Catholic, I'd get on an airplane every Monday morning to go sell computers for Ross Perot. Every Monday morning, I had great fear. What if the plane goes down? Will I end up in hell or purgatory? Heaven was never an option. Now I get on a plane to come to Phoenix. I know if that plane goes down, instantly I'm in the presence of my Savior. Is there any greater joy or peace than knowing that the last breath you take, you'll be in the presence of our Savior. What a glorious gospel we have to, set, to proclaim. Catholic apologists says, listen to this, they believe that we have a different Jesus than they do. The Protestant Jesus, he calls it the Prati Jesus, is different. He's not really present in the Eucharist, did not establish a formal visible church, did not institute any sacraments to speak of, has given all authority over to a book, and never said how that book is to be interpreted. The prodigy Jesus does not care how you live your life as long as you believe on him. Well, let's look at the false Christ of Rome. He did not save sinners completely. He did not give the assurance of salvation. He did not pay the punishment for all sin. He did not purify all sins, which is why they need purgatory. He returns physically to the earth every day. We'll look at that in a moment. He did not finish the work of redemption. He did not redeem man from the curse of the law. He is not the only sinless mediator. 
and he is not the only way. Please make note of this. I think you have it in your outline. This is a different Jesus. This is an imposter. This is a counterfeit Christ. Catholics need to know the true Jesus as he's gloriously revealed in Scripture. A religion that denies the sufficiency of Jesus is not only insulting Jesus Christ, but holding its people in bondage to religious deception. They want to control people with the threat of hell if they don't comply. And ultimately, isn't that the goal of every religion in the world, to control its people? That's why Jesus said, Abide in my word, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free from religious deception, from religious bondage. Well, another Jesus always leads to another gospel. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 11. I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. If someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the one we preached, or if you receive a different spirit or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it. And yet, Roman Catholicism preaches another Jesus. We must use God's word to reprove or expose the counterfeit Christ of Catholicism. Then we must use scripture to correct their false Christology and call them to repentance and faith in the true Christ. So, as I mentioned, another Jesus always leads to another gospel because if Christ is not preached in all of his sufficiency, you need another gospel to instruct people what they must do. Listen to the gospel of the Roman Catholic religion. These are the requirements for Catholics to obtain eternal life. They need to receive the sacraments. These numbers are paragraph numbers of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is not Mike's opinion. This is the official teaching. They also need to participate in the sacrifice of the Mass, paragraph 1405. They need to trust in purgatory to purify their sins. They need to believe in indulgences as a remission of temporal punishment for sin. They need to be baptized. They need to keep the law. Paragraph 2068, do you realize anyone who tries to keep the law for salvation has placed themselves under a curse? That's what we read in Galatians 3. And then you take them to James 2.10. If you were able to keep the whole law perfectly but yet stumble at one part, you're guilty of breaking the entire law. Catholics also need to do good works in order to be justified. Paragraph 2016, you can see the true gospel is foolishness to an unbelieving world. The Roman Catholic Church is no different from every other religion. They teach what you must do in order to gain eternal life. Well, Rome's Jesus did not finish the work of redemption. You see a picture of a priest offering the sacrifice of the Mass. Every time this mystery is celebrated, the work of our redemption is carried on. Paragraph 1405 of the Catechism. And then the Council of Trent says, if anyone says that the sacrifice of the Mass is not propitiatory, let him be anathema. So you and I know that the Mass is not propitiatory because Jesus offered himself once for all time to satisfy the wrath of God. The Mass is not satisfying the wrath of God, but yet Catholics believe that. Catholics are told they must attend the propitiatory Mass every week to turn away the wrath of God from the sins they committed in the previous week. Redemption continues on Catholic altars. Listen to paragraph 1367. The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. The victim is one and the same. In this divine sacrifice, the same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner 
on the altar of the cross is contained and offered in an unbloody manner. Don't you find that fascinating? It's the same sacrifice except for the blood. The very element that is efficacious in purchasing souls out of the slave market of sin, the very element that is needed to purify our sin, it's removed from the mass, and yet they say it's the same sacrifice. Well, we must ask Catholics, why do Roman Catholic priests continue on an altar with Jesus finished on the cross? I was doing a weekend seminar in Emporia, Kansas. We did something very similar to what we're doing this morning. And then Saturday afternoon, we went out to the Roman Catholic Church to witness to Roman Catholics, to put into practice what everybody learned throughout the day. Oftentimes when I travel, I contact the local priest and see if he has an opportunity to meet with me. This priest told me he was too busy, but as we walked into the Catholic Church, there was a red light on over the confessional, and that designated the priest was inside hearing confession. So I turned to the elder of the church and my wife. I said, pray for me. I'm going to go to confession and talk to the priest. So I walked in, and there was no more screen like there was when I grew up. There he was just sitting, waiting for me. I said, I don't even know where to begin. It's been over 30 years since my last confession. <laughs> he said, well, don't you worry. When you leave here, I'll forgive you of all your sins. And then he said, why has it been 30 years? I said, well, I've been reading the Bible. <laughs> he said, well, how has that kept you from the confessional? I said, well, I've been reading in the Bible that goes against my teaching as a Catholic. He said, give me an example. I said, well, in John 19, 30, Jesus cried out, it is finished. So why do you continue on an altar what he finished on the cross? He said, give me another example. <laughs> I said, well, in 1 John 1, 7, it says the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. So why do we need purgatory? He said, I can see this is going to take longer than I thought. He said, why don't you call me on Monday and we'll continue the conversation. So I flew back to Dallas and I called him on Monday morning and by then he knew why we were there. He said, why would you waste your time proselytizing us? Don't you know we're all Christians? I said, no, as I shared with you on the confessional, what you teach goes against the Bible and we have a great love and compassion for Roman Catholics. We want them to know the true gospel so they can repent and believe it. And so I started sharing the gospel with them. And oh, and about five minutes into it, he said, you know what? I was born a Catholic and I'm going to die a Catholic. I said, no, not according to the Bible. You were born a sinner and you're going to die a sinner unless you repent and believe the gospel. Well, then he hung up on me. But at least I had an opportunity to sow the seed of God's word, and we don't know what the Lord will do with that. Hopefully, the Holy Spirit will bring conviction. They call it the same sacrifice. Calvary was offered by the sinless Son of God. The Mass was offered by a sinful man. Calvary was for the living the Mass is for the living and the dead, both suffering and purgatory. The sacrifice of Calvary was one perfect, finished, all-sufficient sacrifice. The Mass is offered thousands of times daily. Every offering is insufficient, which is why it needs to be done over and over again. Calvary was for all sin, and the Mass is only for past sins. That's why Catholics must come back week after week. Calvary was bloody, the mass was bloodless. Calvary is unrepeatable, the mass must continue. How can it be when the mass is bloodless and Calvary was a bloody sacrifice, but yet they say it's the same sacrifice? I want to read a quote from 
Roman Catholic priest, John O'Brien, from his book, The Faith of Millions. And as I read this, I want you to know that this is the official teaching of the Catholic Church. This book has the imprimatur. It's very heartbreaking to read this, but I want you to know what Roman Catholic priests believe they have the power to do. When the priest announces the words of consecration, he reaches up into the heavens and brings Christ down from his throne and places him upon our altar to be offered up again as the victim for the sins of man. It is a power greater than that of saints and angels. The priest speaks, and lo, Christ, the eternal and omnipotent God, bows his head in humble obedience to the priest's command. As preposterous and unthinkable as this may sound, the Catholic priest is said to have the power to call Almighty God down from heaven and continue to do what the Lord Jesus declared is finished. Over 200,000 times every day on Catholic altars throughout the world, priests believe they represent Jesus as a sacrificial victim. Was Jesus a victim or did he go willingly to the cross for you and I? Our Lord Jesus endured excruciating pain and torture for sinners once for all time. He was pierced through for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. It is unconscionable that Catholics would want to continue his suffering on their altars. This is Roman Catholicism. Please make note of this. The next time someone says, I believe in Jesus, which Jesus do you believe in? Is Jesus really present in the wafer? That's what every Roman Catholic priest says. He lifts it up. If you were a Catholic, you remember you came to the altar, Rael. The priest said, body of Christ. And what did you say? Amen. I believe it. But what did Jesus say? If anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, do not believe him. By the authority of Scripture, we know the Eucharist is a false Christ. Here you see a picture of a Eucharist on Envoy magazine, a popular Catholic periodical. It looks like bread, tastes like bread, and feels like bread. Is this God? As you open the magazine, it tries to convince you that the Eucharist has become God. But for Roman Catholics to worship Jesus as a lifeless piece of bread may be the most serious sin of idolatry. Can I take you back to the Israelites when Moses went up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments? They put all their gold together to form a golden calf to worship the true God that delivered them out of Egypt. Did God approve of that? He called it the sin of idolatry. He had 3,000 put to death for worshiping a golden calf. Is worshiping the Eucharist as Jesus Christ any different from worshiping the golden calf as the true God? When Roman Catholics say they've been born again and they've trusted Jesus and repented and believe, they cannot remain in a religion that worships Jesus Christ and the Eucharist. It is pure idolatry. We must call them out so they will not participate in their sins any longer. So discernment is needed. A counterfeit is an imitation created to deceive. And so many Roman Catholics are deceived about who Jesus is. By the authority of Scripture, we can tell Roman Catholics that the Eucharist is a false Christ. We can say that he does not return every day. In Hebrews 9.28, we see he will return a second time and not to deal with sin. This deals with sin on the Catholic altar. It's a counterfeit Christ. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything. When, when will he return? The Bible tells us immediately after the tribulation. 
Matthew 24. We must warn Catholics to look at these verses. Only when they are confronted with the truth will they know they have been deceived about the Eucharist. There's more verses we can point to. He will return to the same place he ascended. You see a picture of the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. This is where Jesus will return. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. How will he return? With power and great glory, Matthew 24. And he will return the same way he left, and he left in a body. This Jesus who was taken up from heaven, taken up from you into heaven, will come back in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Can you see how we can use scripture to expose the lies of Roman Catholicism? God's word says he appeared once to do away with sin, then entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Look at the verb tense. He's already obtained it. But you saw what the Catholic Church teaches. The work of redemption continues on its altar. The body of Christ was offered once as one sacrifice for all sin for all time. Hebrews 10 just destroys the Roman Catholic Mass. His offering made perfect forever those who are sanctified. There are no more offerings for sin. Rome's Jesus did not cancel the eternal sin debt. The sinner must make satisfaction for or expiate his sins by doing penance. Paragraph 1459. Indulgences remit temporal punishment for sins for the living and the dead. Yet scripture says he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And now we can say the great promise of Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Rome's Jesus did not purify all sin. You see a picture of um, an indulgence card here that was given to us as we attended a Roman Catholic funeral. You see at the bottom of the picture, soul suffering in purgatory, the priest offering the Eucharist to God in heaven. All who die in God's grace but still imperfectly purified are assured of salvation, but after death they undergo purification through a purifying fire in purgatory so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter heaven. By one offering, he has made perfect forever. Roman Catholics deny that verse. God's word says when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. When a high priest finishes his work, he sits down. He gave himself for us that he might purify for himself a people for his own possession. Titus 2.14. And then the verse that destroys Roman Catholic purgatory, the blood of Jesus purifies us from some sin, many sins, most sins, all sin, all sin, past and future sins, all purified by the blood of Jesus. Rome's Jesus is not sufficient for salvation. Here you see a picture of a treasury. It's said to contain the prayers and good works of all the saints. In this way, they attain their own salvation. Jesus merely opened the gates of heaven for Catholics. Now they must attain their own salvation. And then they can cooperate in saving their brothers because if they die the, with more than enough merit to get them into heaven, they can put those merits excess into a treasury. And then the Pope can dispense them to those suffering in purgatory. Listen to paragraph 2027. We can merit for ourselves and for others all the graces needed to attain eternal life. When you witness to Catholics, you have to define terms. Well, here you see Catholics are saved by grace. But can you see they have to merit grace? 
How do you merit the unmerited favor of God? God's word says no man can re- by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him for the redemption of his soul is costly and he should cease trying forever. Psalm 49, 7 and 8 destroys the whole concept of indulgences. Jesus is not the only sinless mediator in the Catholic Church. Paragraph 494 says, without a single sin to restrain her, Mary became the cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race, robbing Jesus Christ of his unique glory. But that's not all. Paragraph 969 As mediatrix, she did not lay aside the saving office, but by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. Roman Catholics are so immersed in the veneration of Mary as a sinless mediator. We know that in the end times, Satan will use lying signs and wonders to deceive even the elect if possible. And one of his lying signs and wonders are apparitions of Mary. There is a um, phone number in Dallas you could call, 233-MARY, and they gave you the recording of Mary's latest message from an apparition. I was interviewed for the History Channel on the apparitions of Mary. And I said something in the interview that they used in the opening of their segment. I said, I find it fascinating that people will spend thousands of dollars and travel thousands of miles to get a message from an apparition of Mary when they can open their Bible right where they are and get a message from God. But Roman Catholicism really looks to Mary as a messenger from God, these apparitions. By the way, Muslims are now flocking to apparition sites. Did you know that? The most popular site for Muslims is in Fatima, Portugal, a city named after Muhammad's first daughter. Muslims are going there to get a message from Mary because they esteem Mary as the most revered woman who ever lived. Did you know that Mary appears more in the Quran than she does in the Bible? So it's no wonder that Satan will use apparitions of Mary to bring unity between Islam and Roman Catholicism. They have so much in common. Well, we know that God's word says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's the only one qualified because he's God's perfect man and man's perfect God before our relationship with Christ, we were enemies of God, but through the mediation of Jesus Christ, he's reconciled us to God. Let me share with you how the Roman Catholic Church has elevated Mary almost to the position of the fourth member of the Trinity. They haven't declared that yet, but look at the comparison. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Mary's the Queen of Peace. Jesus is the Son of God. Catholics believe Mary is the Mother of God. How can that be? That means she had to pre-exist the eternal God. Jesus ascended into glory. Mary was assumed into glory. Jesus is the King of Heaven. Mary is the Queen of Heaven. Jesus is the Mediator. Mary is the Mediatrix. Jesus is the Redeemer. Mary is the Co-Redeemer. Jesus is the advocate. Catholics believe Mary is the advocate as well. Both Jesus and Mary are said to be sinless. Jesus is the source of grace. Mary is the channel of grace. I don't know if you remember the Baltimore Catechism, those of you who grew up Catholic, but they showed how God's grace is dispensed. It comes from the Father through the hands of Mary, through the priest, into the sacraments, to the people. It all goes through Mary. Jesus was the second Adam. Mary is the second Eve. Well, in closing, we know that Jesus is sufficient. Every believer is set free by his truth, born again by the seed of his word, purified from sin by his blood, 
forgiven by his substitutionary atonement, justified with his imputed righteousness, saved by his grace, reconciled to God through his mediation, and eternally secured by his promises. What a glorious Savior we have to proclaim. And may God give us all the motivation and the compassion to reach out to Roman Catholics with the true Christ. Jesus Christ is also exclusive. Jesus said the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and only a few find it. I'll never forget my uncle, the priest, who came to Dallas on his furlough and each time he would come, we would open the Bible and plead with him to believe God's word over the traditions of his religion. I'll never forget one night he just threw up his hands and said, Mike, how can one billion Catholics be wrong? I said, well, can we let Jesus answer that? And I turned to Matthew chapter 7, and I talked about, I showed him how Jesus said the gate is narrow and the way is hard, and yet there's a broad way and many people are on it. Just because there's one billion Roman Catholics traveling down one path does not mean it is the true way. In the context of Matthew 7, Jesus said, beware of false teachers. And so you have this imagery that false teachers are standing in front of the narrow gate saying, it's not here, it's the broad way, redirecting people to the broad way that leads to destruction. My last semester at seminary, I put together these two paths to eternity, and these are available in our gospel track, the red one, Roman Catholicism, Scripture versus Tradition. Every time we share these two paths to eternity with Roman Catholics, they all agree that they are on the Roman Catholic path. They believe they're born destined for hell, but it's water baptism that puts them on the road to heaven. When they commit venial sins, they lose some of their right standing. When they commit a mortal sin, they're de-justified, destined for hell. Only by doing good works and receiving the sacraments can they merit enough grace to get them back on the road to heaven. You see the invisible treasury there. As a Roman Catholic, I went through this cycle hundreds of times, never knowing where I stood before a holy and righteous God. At the end of a Catholic's life, if he's never heard the gospel, or if he's heard it and rejected it, he will stand before the Lord Jesus, and he will or she will hear the most terrifying words anyone could ever hear when Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you, and they're cast into the eternal lake of fire. This is why I have such a compassion for Roman Catholics. I traveled this road for 35 years. I never knew I was on the wide road to destruction. That's the nature of deception. You never know you're deceived until you're confronted with the truth. You and I need to point Catholics to the biblical path. It's not water baptism. It's faith in Christ. At that very moment, the gavel comes down. We are justified and declared righteous. And then we begin the process of sanctification with the great promise in Romans 8.1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. At the end of a believer's life or at the rapture of the church, we'll stand before the Lord Jesus and hopefully then hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And then we'll sing his praises throughout all eternity. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Don't we have a glorious gospel to declare and proclaim? Well, we must tell Catholics something finished does not continue. A cross is not an altar. A debt forgiven is not still owed. If some benefactor came to you and said, I paid off your mortgage, wouldn't it be foolish for you to continue to send in your monthly payments? Jesus canceled the eternal sin debt. A fire in purgatory cannot purify sin, only blood. A gift cannot be merited or earned. Something false cannot be true. Denying Christ's sufficiency is an insult to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what must we do? Glorify our Lord Jesus Christ 
by declaring his all-sufficient work of redemption. Reprove and correct those who embrace Catholicism is a valid expression of Christianity. I can't overemphasize the importance of exposing these false teachers who declare that we share a common faith with Roman Catholics and the gospel of Christ. All they're doing is discouraging people from evangelizing Roman Catholics. We need to demonstrate our love and compassion for Catholics by sharing the true Christ and his gospel. We must eliminate all confusion among the sheep and identify the Roman Catholic Church for what it is, an apostate religion that's made up of precious souls that need to be evangelized. And don't forget the resources that we have available. We have a gospel track entitled, Which Jesus Do You Trust? And in this gospel track, I share with you pretty much what I've shared with you in this message to prove to Catholics that they're worshiping a false Christ. We also have a DVD entitled, Which Jesus Do You Trust? Don't forget our gospel tracks. They are so important. Carry them with you wherever you go. You will be amazed how many opportunities you have to sow the seed of God's word. The track in the middle with the gift on it, the whole track is God's word broken into six different categories. When you give this away to people, you're literally sowing the imperishable seed of God's word. And then you pray to the sovereign Lord that the seed would find fertile ground and begin to grow and bring forth life. Don't forget our book, Preparing for Eternity, DVDs that you can share with Roman Catholics. You can either invite them over or give the, the DVD to them and then I ask them for an opportunity to sit down and talk about it. And don't forget our website, proclaimingthegospel.org, wealth of information for you to equip yourself for the work of an, of an evangelist. So what do we got, about a 10-minute break, Kyle? Yeah, I think what we'll do at this point is I, I want to give everyone a moment to to stretch and, and sure. grab a snack and everything. So we're actually going to do 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, you can go outside and thaw out. I know it's a little chilly in here, but that'll feel good. You'll get really, really warm and then come back in here. Uh, there's still snacks and beverages over in the worship center lobby. Uh, you'll see a countdown up here when we're going to start back up again. And uh, I just saw Trevor and Amy putting on name tags. So I wanted to remind you, put on name tags and get to know each other if you don't know each other. And uh, use this time to uh, invest in each other in fellowship, okay? Great. So this next message is really what you all came for. How to evangelize Catholics biblically. Now that you know their history and how they drifted into apostasy and why it's important to establish the supreme authority of Scripture and the sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ, now we will look at how to evangelize Catholics God's way. <clears throat> One of the things I'd like to share with you is that <clears throat> I've also had my book translated into several different languages. And the one that we have in Spanish is available free for anybody that simply emails us. The reason it's free is because we found out that shipping it to many Spanish-speaking countries is very cost-prohibitive. So what we do is we send out the PDF, and so you can actually email it to any of your Spanish-speaking friends and loved ones throughout the world, and they can also share it with their circle of influence. So we really want the Word of God to go forth and Catholics to see how they can prepare for eternity by repenting and believing the gospel. So we've talked about how the Roman Catholic religion is the most, well, the largest mission field in the world. Some would say, well, Islam is, is also large, but the Catholic religion is the most neglected mission field in the world. Uh, everybody knows Muslims are lost, but the average evangelical is confused about the Roman Catholic Church. Is it a mission field or do they represent brothers and sisters in Christ that share a common faith in the gospel of Christ. 
I think by now you recognize it's not a Christian denomination, but an apostate religion that needs to be evangelized. So when we look at the question, why do Catholics need to be evangelized? According to the authority of God's word, you've seen they worship and trust another Jesus and believe a false gospel, which has them on the wide road to destruction. I think all of us would agree that the most cruel and wicked thing anyone could ever do is deceive people about life's most important decision, and that is, what must I do to be saved? When you witness to Roman Catholics, you need to expect a stubborn resistance. Indoctrination is a captivating power that causes a strong resistance to God's word. Religious pride may be Satan's most powerful tool to blind people. You're familiar with 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the prince of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ. If you'll back up one chapter to 2 Corinthians 3.18, you will see that the veil of blindness that covers every man's heart remains until they turn to Christ. So as long as Catholics are listening to their priest, listening to their pope, the veil of blindness remains. But if they will turn to Christ and his word, there is a promise there that the veil of blindness will be removed as the Spirit of God brings conviction and illumination. Indoctrination, a powerful tool. If you grew up Catholic, you know what I'm talking about. From the time you could think, you've been indoctrinated with certain Catholic positions, including that they belong to the one true church. And the Protestants are the Johnny-come-latelys. Our church started only 500 years ago, which obviously is wrong. Our church started 2,000 years ago. As you saw yesterday, there is a steady stream of born-again Christians down through the ages. So some of the indoctrinations that need to be overcome by sharing the truth of God's word is how Catholics are utterly dependent upon their priest. They believe heaven can be merited by their works. Venial sins do not send them to hell. I often call venial sins, purgatory, and indulgences, the perfect trifecta of the Roman Catholic religion. All three of them are intertwined. We know from Scripture that all sins are mortal. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sins will surely die. But Catholics say, no, there are lesser sins that do not send anyone to hell. There's great pressure to remain Catholic from family members and from the culture. The priests often tell Catholics, don't even try reading the Bible. It's too difficult to understand. By the way, some of that is changing now. The Catholic Church actually is trying to emulate the evangelical church by conducting their own Bible studies. It's called the Little Rock Scripture Study. You may have heard of it. And what they do is they pattern it after community Bible study, and um, some of the other evangelical studies. What they found out was that Catholics who wanted to know about the Bible were going to evangelical Bible studies, so they want to keep them in the church. Catholics believe they belong to the one true church. So these are all powerful indoctrinations. What you see on your screen now are two circles. One contains the Bible, and the other circle contains Roman Catholic traditions you can see that there is an overlap, that we do share common truth with Roman Catholics, and those are often called the fundamentals of the faith. We both believe that Jesus is the second person of the triune God. He's the eternal son of God that was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, obeyed the law perfectly, died on Calvary's cross for the sins of the world, was raised three days later, and will come back to judge the living and the dead. Those are the common truths that we share. In the Bible, though, we know that everything we need to know about our salvation is fully contained therein. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4, Paul describes the gospel as the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the Scripture. The Roman Catholic traditions outside the Bible nullify and oppose the gospel, and we saw how they do that 
by the sake of their tradition, nullifying the very word of God. So let's look at some of these traditions that distort the gospel. The Catholic Church denies salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to Scripture alone. They reject eternal life, which is the very promise of the gospel. And I hope you realize this. It's not only important as we witness to Catholics, but there are many in quote-unquote Christian denominations, some of which have gone apostate, that deny the promise of the gospel. There are many professing Christians that believe in conditional life, not eternal life. And I hope you realize if a person does not believe the promise of the gospel, they need to be evangelized. Because if you're not believing the promise of the gospel, which is eternal life, you're not believing the gospel. So anyone that doubts their salvation or doesn't believe the promise of the gospel needs to be evangelized. Roman Catholic traditions continue the work of redemption on an altar that Jesus finished on the cross, and Roman Catholicism denies that all sins are mortal. So knowing these distortions of the gospel will help us all focus on correcting their errant faith. So let me share with you six keys for witnessing to Catholics. We've already seen the primary principle, establish the supreme authority of God's word, we need to declare the sufficiency of Jesus. Then we need to get the gospel right. We need to define the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. We need to teach antithetically. As you study your Bible, look how many times the apostles taught antithetically, not only teaching what is the truth, but also teaching what opposes the truth so that people will know that and they can repent of any false way. We also need to pray, pray for open doors, pray for open hearts. So the first one then, establish God's word as the supreme authority. We covered this last night, but 2 Corinthians 3.16 is a great verse to take Roman Catholics to. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, which means exposing error, for correction, which means correcting false doctrine, and for training in righteousness. God has exalted his name and his word above all things. We've seen that scripture has authority over men. Great verse to take Roman Catholics to is Acts 17, 11, where the Bereans search the scripture daily to test the veracity of an apostle's teaching. So if an apostle comes under the scrutiny of God's word, then we also need to test every man's teaching. The attack on the supreme authority of scripture is really the reason why the Roman Catholic Church drifted into apostasy. We also have seen that scripture has authority over a religious tradition. Mark 7, verses 7 to 9 is a great passage to take Catholics to because Jesus rebuked the apostate Jews, saying, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. In doing so, you invalidate the very word of God. God's word was given through men superintended by the Holy Spirit so that their writings are without error. Then Paul asserted the usefulness of the word for teaching instruction to believers, the truth of God's word, so that they could rebuke anything that opposes God's word. This is a, a no-brainer, but we need to exhort Roman Catholics to read God's word. Remember, it is perfect and true and errant and fallible and eternal. It saves people. It frees and guides people. It reproves and trains. It corrects and converts. It sanctifies and it equips for every good work. It brings conviction. It gives wisdom. It produces faith, refutes error, and is a sword that can slay the devil's lies. I love this picture because... It shows how dust is collected on the Bible. And as I shared with you last night, 
I had the big coffee table version of the Catholic Bible, but all it did was sit on my coffee table collecting dust. Praise God, he influenced me to open it when I was 35 years old and begin reading it. Only then did I realize I was in deceptive. I was caught in religious deception. Second, we need to declare the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. He died once for all sin for all time. There are no more offerings for sin. Please make sure you share Hebrews 10. It destroys the Roman Catholic Mass. Hebrews 7.25, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. That means if you're coming to God through Roman Catholic priests, you cannot be saved. Jesus Christ is the one mediator. You must approach God through him. He accomplished everything necessary to save sinners, and then he cried out in victory, it is finished. Catholics deny the sufficiency of Christ. To his finished work, they add the mass. To his word, they add their tradition. To his headship, they add a pope. To his unique role as sinless mediator, they add Mary. To his high priestly office, they add the confessional box. To his infinite merit, they add their own. And to his purifying blood, they add purgatory. This is Roman Catholicism. This is how they deny the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, we will go out to Roman Catholic churches on Resurrection Sunday or on Christmas Eve, and we'll share the, Rome, we'll share the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ with Catholics. And I'll never forget one particular Christmas Eve, we were sharing our gospel tract that contains all scripture. And one priest came up to me and said, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. I said, all we're doing is being obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're being faithful to the Great Commission, commission sharing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then I shared with him what we were giving to Catholics. These are all scriptures. He said, how would you like it if we did this at your church? I said, please do. We need the gospel there too. <laughs> but then a few moments later, another man came up to me and said, why are you here? Don't you know we're all Christians? And he, it turned out, was the producer of Roman Catholic Radio in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And as we talked, he said, would you mind coming on my radio show Monday morning and explaining to my audience why you're here proselytizing Roman Catholics? And I corrected him and said, I'm not proselytizing. I'm, I'm carrying out the Great Commission, sharing the gospel with them. He said, well, will you come on the radio? I said, sure. And so I had a lot of people praying because I felt like it might be a little sabotage. And um, what happened is it was going to be a 30-minute interview. He was going to interview me for 15 minutes, and then he was going, going to open up the phone lines all over Dallas-Fort Worth for callers to call in and ask me questions. Well, in the first 15 minutes, every question he asked me, I answered with the authority of God's word. He was very frustrated. He didn't know where to go with it. And so during the commercial break, after 15 minutes of sharing God's word with Roman Catholics throughout Dallas-Fort Worth, he came on during the commercial break and said, there will be no call-in questions. This interview is over. And I thought to myself, you know, here I thought I was going out to reach a few Roman Catholics on Christmas Eve with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when we are faithful to the Lord, he expands our territory, doesn't he? And so instead of just reaching a few Roman Catholics on Christmas Eve, the Lord made it possible for his gospel, his word to go out on Roman Catholic radio throughout all of Dallas-Fort Worth. So remember that as you're faithful to a few God will expand your territory. To the righteousness of Christ, Roman Catholics add their own filthy rags. And that's what the prophet Isaiah called all the works people do prior to justification. They're all filthy rags of unrighteousness. So the third principle as we witness to Roman Catholics is we need to get the gospel right. 
I want to share with you some characteristics of the gospel, and I'm sure this is familiar to all of you, but it's really worth taking a look at. The gospel that we share is the eternal gospel. It is the same message for every generation. We see that in Revelation 14, 6. The eternal gospel will go throughout the world and then the end will come. It was first pronounced in the garden when Adam and Eve fell into sin. The gospel was delivered to Abraham, as we see in Galatians 3. This gospel was delivered to the apostles. And the same gospel is what will save everyone who repents and believes it. The same message for every generation. The Old Testament Jews looked forward to the cross of Christ as a coming Messiah that would die for the sins of the people. New Testament saints look back to the cross, but everyone in heaven will be there because they believed the one and only eternal gospel. We also see that the gospel is exclusive. It dares to say that all other religions and all other faiths are false. And this is where the offense of the gospel comes in. Are you telling me that you believe there's only one way to heaven? Yes, that's because the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the way for those who are lost. He is the truth for those who are deceived. And he is the very life for those who are dead in their sin. No one comes to the Father except through Christ. The gospel is according to Scripture alone. The Bible doesn't point us to any other authority, to any other book, to any other person. If you want to know how to be saved, you read the scriptures. Therein lies the gospel. The gospel has divine power to save those who believe it. That's the theme verse of our ministry. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe it. When you proclaim the gospel, there is inherent power in the gospel. The gospel is of grace. Those who add anything to the gospel stand condemned. Oh, how important is this as we share with Roman Catholics? You're familiar with Galatians 1, verses 6 to 9. The Judaizers came into town saying, we believe in the Lord Jesus. But if you're a Gentile, you not only need to believe, you need to be circumcised. What did Paul say? Let's have unity with these per- These brothers, they all profess Christ? No, he said, let them be anathema. Let them be condemned. Let them be turned over to God for destruction, for daring to add one requirement to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the last hour, you saw the Roman Catholic gospel. You saw all the requirements they've added to the gospel of grace. Now, with the Judaizers were under anathema for adding circumcision, placing them back under the law, how many more times is the Roman Catholic priest and clergy condemned for adding additional requirements to the gospel? Romans 11.6, if it is by grace, it is not of works. Otherwise, grace is not grace. Satan knows this. That's why every religion in the world is a works righteousness salvation. Satan knows that grace is the only means by which God saves sinners. So he knows that if he can get people to do things, it nullifies God's grace. And so all the religions in the world teach a works righteousness salvation. By the way, that's going to be a common bond of all the religions coming together to worship Antichrist. When the true church of Jesus Christ is taken to heaven... There will be many professing Christians left, but they will all be trying to gain heaven by their filthy rags of righteousness, joining hands with all the other works righteousness religions. So before the Lord saved me, I was a rocket scientist down at Cape Kennedy, Florida, One of the first things I learned when I was there was that when the astronauts re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, they must get the angle of re-entry precisely correct. If they come into the atmosphere too heavy, they will burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. 
If they come in to light, they will skip off the Earth's atmosphere back into space. You're saying, well, Mike, what has this got to do with the gospel? If you take anything away from the gospel, it's no longer the gospel, and you will skip off into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you add anything to the gospel, you will burn up in the eternal lake of fire. We must get the gospel precisely correct. In some sense, it's like your email address, and I know my wife can verify this as you sign up for our e-newsletter. If you get one letter wrong or she can't read one letter, you'll not get our newsletter. The email address must be precisely correct in order to obtain the monthly newsletter. And so it is with the gospel. We cannot add anything to it. We cannot take anything away from it. It must be presented as an exclusive gospel. Here's the Catholic gospel again. They have to be baptized. They have to receive the sacraments. They have to participate in the sacrifice of the mass. They must believe purgatory will purge away their venial sins. They must believe indulgences will remit temporal punishment for sin. They must do good works in order to be justified. They must keep the law, which, of course, places them under a curse. Remember the words of the Apostle Paul, If any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. This image of a burden on the back of a Roman Catholic is so, so typical of what Catholics must do in order to be saved. When you talk about the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God that will save those who come to Christ with empty hands of faith, this is good news for Roman Catholics. Oftentimes the way I express it to Catholics is, the only way that God will save you is if you come to the cross of Christ bringing nothing but your sins. You must leave everything else behind. You must come with empty hands of faith, which means you must trust Christ alone. Do away with anything you're doing. Trust everything that Christ has done. Well, what about good works? This is often an issue that comes up. Roman Catholics love to point to James 2.24. The only, they say the only place where faith alone occurs is in James' epistle. How do you answer that? Well, we have to understand the timeline. Prior to salvation, the prophet Isaiah says, all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. When we come to the cross of Christ with empty hands of faith, at that very moment, we repent and believe the gospel, we are justified. And then after we are justified, Ephesians 2.10 says we are created in Christ Jesus for good works prepared for, by God for us to walk in. We come to the cross bringing nothing. Once we are born again, we're new creatures in Christ we do the works that God has prepared for us to walk in after salvation. So how do you, how do you explain James 2.24? Is James disagreeing with the Apostle Paul? For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works so that no man may boast. Paul is defining the nature of salvation. James is defining the nature of faith. James is not teaching in chapter 2 how to be justified. James is contrasting God-given living faith that is enduring and will produce fruit. He's comparing that and contrasting that with dead faith that produces no works. James says, show me your faith by your works. Faith is invisible. So the only way that we can show that we have been born again is by our good works. That's a demonstration that we're new creatures in Christ. So James is contrasting living and dead faith. Paul is defining how to be saved, the nature of salvation. That's how we explain James chapter 2 to Roman Catholics. And be ready because it will come up often. 
He's contrasting two different kinds of faith. Another way to say it, faith is the root. If the root is alive, it will produce fruit. If the root is dead, there will be no fruit. Dead faith does not produce fruit. How do you know you have living faith? It's evidenced by your good works. And by the word, the word, by the way, the word justification in that context of James 2 is a word that also means to vindicate. In fact, uh, James even talks about Abraham was vindicated by his works, offering his son Isaac. That was a demonstration that he had true living faith. And so we vindicate our faith to others by the demonstration of our good works. So be ready for that. It comes up often. Did you know that Satan's first lie in the garden is perpetuated by Roman Catholicism? Satan told Eve, you surely shall not die if you disobey God in Genesis 3, 4. Roman Catholicism teaches you surely shall not die if you commit venial sins. This is the lie of the devil in the garden, a perpetuation of Satan's lie. John MacArthur calls this the safety net for Roman Catholics. If you grew up Roman Catholic, you probably rationalized your sin, that most of your sins were venial. They weren't serious enough to warrant eternal death in hell. So Roman Catholics rationalize that many of their sins will not send them to hell, only to purgatory, which turns out to be their safety net. Paragraph 1863, venial sins do not cause death, only temporal punishment. So what do we have to do with Roman Catholics? We need to share with them that the wages of sin is death. The soul that sins will surely die, Ezekiel 18.4. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. What I'd like to share in the next few minutes is the doctrine of justification and how Roman Catholics totally distort and pervert the central doctrine of the gospel. The reformers said the doctrine of justification is the hinge upon which the gates of heaven open and close. They said if you get justification wrong, you get the gospel wrong. So what is justification? It declares the inflexible righteousness of God as the judge who must punish every sin that's ever been committed by everyone who has ever lived. All sin is mortal. God will punish every sin ever committed. The only way condemned sinners can be justified is through faith in the sin-bearing, substitutionary death and resurrection of Christ alone who satisfied divine justice. So let's look at the contrasting views on justification. We know from the Bible that justification is the change of one's legal status before God, whereby a condemned sinner has been acquitted and declared righteous. And we see Paul explaining that in Romans 5, verses 12 to 21. That's why you see a gavel on the screen. The gavel comes down, and because of your faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that he canceled the eternal sin debt, the gavel comes down, you're no longer condemned, you are now justified by a holy and righteous God. But Rome says, no, justification does not change a man's legal status. It changes the inner man, paragraph 2019 of the Catechism. Justification, according to God's word, is instantaneous. But according to the Roman Catholic Church, it is a process. It is the ongoing renewal of the interior man. What Roman Catholicism does is they confuse sanctification with justification. We know that at the moment we are justified, then we begin the process of sanctification through the power of the Holy Spirit, putting to death the evil deeds of the flesh and conforming our life to the life of Christ. Rome says that's justification. 
Rome says initial justification is by the sacrament of water baptism, paragraph 1992, but yet the Bible clearly states that justification is by faith in what Christ accomplished on behalf of sinners, Romans 5.1. The Bible declares that justification is permanent. It's never lost by sin. The legal status of a justified man is as unchangeable as the righteousness of Christ. By one offering, he has made perfect forever those who are being sanctified. It's a permanent right standing before God. It is unchangeable. But once again, Rome says no. Justification is temporal. It can be lost by sin and regained through the sacrament of penance and good works. That's why on the screen you see two arrows, one going up and one going down. Roman Catholics believe that after you are de-justified by a mortal sin, you can be re-justified by doing good works, receiving the sacraments, and becoming more and more right before God when you commit a mortal sin you lose your status of justification, you are declared unjustified. The Bible declares that God justifies the ungodly, Romans 4, 5. But once again, Rome says no. It teaches final justification is for those who become righteous, thus rejecting Philippians 3, 9. By the way, this is a great passage to take Roman Catholics to. In Philippians chapter 3, you see Paul exhibiting his resume. If anyone had reason to boast in his own righteousness and his own religious activities, it was Paul. But in the end, Paul considered it all rubbish, exchanging his religion for a relationship with God, exchanging his own righteousness for the perfect righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to encourage Catholics to do the same. Exchange your religion for a relationship with Christ. The Bible teaches that justification is the imputation of Christ's completed righteousness to the justified sinner. 2 Corinthians 5.21 spells that out so beautifully. But once again, Rome says no. Justification is the infusion of righteousness which renews the interior man. Every time you receive a sacrament as a Catholic, you're infused with more and more righteousness, denying again the imputation, the crediting of Christ's righteousness to the repentant sinner. The Bible declares that justification is by grace apart from works. Christ's righteousness is given as a gift. Romans 5.17 Rome says justification must include good works. Rejustification must be merited by making satisfaction for sins through penance, through works of mercy. And then from the Council of Trent, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, let him be anathema. Can you see the importance of the doctrine of justification? Why are evangelical leaders daring to say that we share a common faith in the gospel with Roman Catholics when they condemn us for believing that we're justified by faith alone? And the Bible condemns Roman Catholicism for preaching another gospel. There can be no unity with Roman Catholics. The doctrine of justification sets us apart. After justification, all the sins are no longer taken into account or punished. Don't you love what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 21? That God is reconciling the world to himself through Jesus Christ, not counting men's sins against them. All of our sins were placed on Christ. Romans 4, 5, Paul says, blessed is the man whose sin God does not take into account. That is the greatest news, that once you are born again, 
God no longer takes your sins into account. The promise of Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You know what Roman Catholics say when you share the good news with them? Oh, so all you have to do is believe in Jesus, then you continue in your sin? No. Titus 2, 11 to 14, the grace that brought us salvation teaches us to say no to ungodliness, no to worldly passions, and to live a self-controlled life. When I recognized that the sinless Son of God went to the cross to be immersed in the wrath of God as my substitute, I want to live my life pleasing to him out of love and thanksgiving for what he did for me. They just don't understand what it means to be justified whereby there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But again, that's how the religion controls its people. Rome says all sins, all sins committed after justification may be punished either in purgatory or in hell. The Bible teaches God promises to glorify everyone he justifies because those justified can never be condemned. I was teaching on a cruise to Israel several years ago, and there was a Roman Catholic priest on board, easily identifiable because he was wearing his collar everywhere he went. So I sat down with him at one time and began sharing the word of God and the gospel with him. I came to Romans 8.30 and I said, is it true that you believe Catholics are justified by water baptism? He said, yes, that's what we teach. And is it also true that when that Catholic grows up, commits a mortal sin and dies in that state, he will go to hell? Yes, that's what we teach. I said, well, how do you explain Romans 8.30? Those God justifies, he glorifies. He scratched his head and said, you know, we just don't have an answer for that. Rather than submitting to the authority of God's word and repenting and believing what it says, we just don't have an answer for that. Rome says God will condemn to hell everyone who is justified but who dies in mortal sin. So grace and works are mutually exclusive in justification. You can do nothing to save yourself. Any attempt to do so nullifies justifying grace and insults Jesus and his all-sufficient work. What Jesus has done to save sinners gives all the glory to God and his saving grace. All boasting is in Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Our newest track is entitled, You Can Never Do What Christ Has Done. And this track deals with all those who believe they can get to heaven by their own works righteousness. In this gospel track, it lists all the things that Christ accomplished, everything Christ has done to save sinners completely and forever. It calls those who are trusting in their works to repent and put their faith in Christ alone. I never mention Roman Catholics in this gospel track, but it's not only good for them, it's good for Methodists and Anglicans and Episcopalians and Orthodox, anyone who believes they can achieve salvation by their works. So the fourth principle as we witness to Catholics, we need to define the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Isaiah 53 verse 5 he was pierced for our transgressions. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. We must tell Catholics, they must read God's word to discover they are broken God's law and they are condemned by God's justice. They deserve God's wrath. They need God's mercy. And their only hope is the substitutionary atonement of God's son. Remember, this is foreign to Roman Catholics. 
they have never heard about the penal substitution of our Lord Jesus Christ. I um, always look for opportunities to share the gospel. Some of them I'm moved by the Holy Spirit to share the gospel when otherwise I might not have. And there are times when I've embarrassed my wife, but she's now accustomed to it. She's ready any time I do. There was a time that we were in Munster, Texas, a town that's dominated by Roman Catholicism, maybe 90%. There's one lighthouse in Munster, Texas, a Baptist church that invited me up to equip the saints to reach out to the Catholic population. And we were sitting in a diner before I went to preach Sunday morning. And as I looked over the dining room, I saw there's 50 people, and I did the math. I figured 45 people are probably Roman Catholics here having breakfast. Well, as we started to walk out of the restaurant, something came over me, and I just turned around, and I picked up a spoon, and I started banging on a glass. <laughs> the whole restaurant became quiet. And I said, now that I have your attention, I want you to know that I've come all the way from Dallas to show how you can have your sins completely forgiven and be reconciled to God. And I'm going to be giving this message across the street at the Baptist Church, and all of you are welcome to come. Well, we walked out of that restaurant, and my wife looked at me. <laughs> she said, Munster, Texas, no problem, but if you ever do that in Dallas, I will kill you. <laughs> Well, the fact that I'm still alive, you know I haven't done it in Dallas. We have a glorious gospel to proclaim, but we also need to teach antithetically, and that simply means we need to contrast what the truth of God's word reveals alongside what Satan's lies are. And I think a good example is two verses that have set so many Catholics free. Listen to how Paul is teaching antithetically. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no man may boast. Why is Paul teaching antithetically? So people who are trusting their works can repent of their works and put their trust in the grace of God by faith in Christ alone. So we not only need to present the truth, we need to show what opposes the truth. Another verse where Paul teaches antithetically is Titus chapter 3. He saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. We also need to pray. The apostle Paul was a great example of the need for prayer. Remember in Romans chapter 10 verse 1, he's praying for the salvation of the Israelites they had a zeal for God, but it wasn't based on knowledge, and so they sought to obtain their own righteousness, not knowing the righteousness God's righteousness requires. I shared with you last night, this is a passage that really placed a burden on me to reach out to Roman Catholics who have a zeal for God, but it's not based on biblical knowledge, and they too are seeking to obtain a right standing before God with their own righteous deeds, not knowing that God's righteousness requires perfection. So we need to pray for the salvation of those blinded by religious deception. Pray for the words to be given to fearlessly make known the gospel. Here you have the apostle Paul, who authored over half the New Testament, and yet he prayed to God that God would give him the words to say to make the gospel known. We need to pray for open doors and open hearts for us to proclaim Christ clearly. The words of Paul in Colossians 4, verses 2 to 4. God is the one that opens doors. And God is the one that opens hearts as he opened the heart of Lydia. We pray to a sovereign Lord. He's the one that gives the increase. What is our responsibility we deliver the message of Christ and then we leave the results to the sovereign Lord. We need to pray for wisdom to make the most of every opportunity. 
I hope you do that. If not, I, I hope that you will do that. Remember the Lord Jesus said the fields are white for harvest, but the laborers are few. The fact that you're here this weekend shows that you are interested in becoming better equipped and better motivated to share the gospel of Christ. My wife and I have a prayer list. We pray for those who need salvation. What a joy it is when we can cross their names off. The Lord has brought them to saving grace. We also pray for divine appointments as we go out during the week. And the sovereign Lord will prepare you for divine appointments. The question is, how do you know if God has set a divine appointment for you? The only way you can know is if you ask questions as you engage people throughout your day, throughout your week. Even if it's meeting a person only for a moment in an elevator or in the line at the post office or at the checkout counter at the grocery store, has anybody shared any good news with you yet today? Do you hope that you will go to heaven one day? What are you trusting in? Are you a Christian? What church do you go to? How does your church teach you have any hope of going to heaven? These are all quick questions that you can ask somebody if you only have a few moments with them. And then the very least you can do if you don't have time or they don't have time to continue is to leave a gospel track behind. Sow the seed of God's imperishable seed wherever you go. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of people who picked up gospel tracks. One particular guy had just lost everything he had in the stock market. He went to the gym to work out. After his workout, he saw that there was a publication in his locker. It was a gospel track. He read it. He cried out to the Lord for salvation. A few years later, he was working for Lamb and Lion Ministry as an evangelist, all because someone left a gospel track for him to pick up and read and discover the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So we really believe in literature evangelism. You've probably heard of shoplifting. We believe in shop dropping. <laughs> <laughs> we go into Catholic bookstores and we place the good news in Roman Catholic books. We want Catholics to buy a book to know the gospel. We go into Catholic churches and we put our gospel tracts and hymnals and the sacristy and donation boxes. I mean, wherever we go, we're, we're sowing the seed of God's word. It used to be you could put a quarter in a machine and take a newspaper out full of bad news. We would put a quarter in, we put our gospel tracts in all the newspapers so that people had an opportunity to discover the glorious gospel of grace. So wherever you go, you can sow the seed of God's word. John MacArthur has this to say about Roman Catholicism. And by the way, as I read this, I want to share what brought this about. This is on KCBI Radio, the largest Christian radio station in Dallas-Fort Worth. He said, Catholicism is a false system. It's not the Church of Christ, it's the Church of Antichrist. If you follow Catholic theology, you'll go to hell. I'm not saying this to be unkind, but, but to be truthful. Being truthful is the only way to be kind. People need to come out of that system. It is a system that exalts Mary, and it's a system of paganism mingled with pseudo-Christianity. This was John MacArthur almost 20 years ago, he was doing a question and answer from KCBI listeners in the auditorium there at Criswell College. And one of my dear friends was there and he went there to ask John MacArthur one question. He said, what do you think of radio stations that promote Roman Catholic services during Lent? And this is when John MacArthur responded with this quote. He was being truthful. He knew that there would probably be Roman Catholics listening to the radio program. He wanted them to know that you're in a false religion. You need to come out because it's not Christian. It's the religion of Antichrist. 
We need more people like John MacArthur that are bold and courageous. He did this out of love for Roman Catholics. The only way Catholics will know they're deceived is if they're lovingly confronted with the truth. And that's the nature of deception, right? People never know they're deceived until they're confronted with the truth. And you and I have been entrusted with the truth of God's word. We are truth bearers. We need to lovingly confront Catholics and their deception. That is their only hope. We had just finished doing a conference in, um, let's see. We just finished doing a conference in Wisconsin. Well, I've lost my slides here. There we go. <clears throat> Three-day conference up in Wisconsin, and Jane and I were both totally exhausted. We couldn't wait to get on the plane and just lean back and, and take a nap. And as we were sitting there on the tarmac, there was a businessman that was conducting business on his cell phone, speaking so loud that people five rows up and five rows back heard every detail of his transaction. And it was so annoying, and I thought to myself, I've got business to conduct as well. <laughs> so I brought out my cell phone, and I pretended I was talking to someone on the other end, giving the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> And about five minutes into it, my wife elbows me in the side and says, you better hope your phone doesn't start ringing. <laughs> Always looking for opportunities. We have the greatest news anyone could ever hear. I shared with you that we need to encourage those who are lost to enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. The gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets. This is the context of the Lord giving these exhortations. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. I shared with you the two paths to eternity. We must speak the truth in love. What do we mean by that? We must tell people that God does not impute his righteousness until sinners are first stripped of their own. We must tell those who are lost that God does not make sinners alive in Christ until they know they are dead in their sins. We must declare that all sins are mortal. As we go out to Roman Catholic churches, we have some very unique experiences, as you can imagine. One particular time, we were out on Christmas Eve, and we were sharing pure scripture, the God, God's word, through our gospel tracts. And there was a particular nun that looked at what we were sharing, and she crumbled it up in her hands. My wife said, that's God's word. She said, we don't need that here. Jane said, can you believe what you're saying? You don't need the word of God here? There was another time that we were sharing at another Catholic church, and, you know, it's only a matter of time when we're out there that somebody goes and reports us to the priest, and this particular time a Monsignor came out, and he was a towering guy, about six foot four, and he stood in front of me, and he was glaring down at me, and told me that we needed to leave, and I said, we have every right to be here. I was baptized a Roman Catholic, and you've never excommunicated me. <laughs> and he said, I'm demanding that you leave. This conversation is over. I said, I'm being obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm being faithful to his great commission I'm sharing the glorious gospel of Christ with the Catholics that are gathered here today. He said, you must leave. This conversation is over. I said, this conversation will be over as soon as you turn around and walk away. Well, he walked away and he walked around to the other side of the church and there my wife was witnessing to one of his priests 
And she was actually making headway, and she let him know that the blood of all these people would be on his hands for shutting the gates of heaven with a false and fatal gospel. And she said, I would really like to share with you what the true gospel is because God will hold you accountable one day for what you're doing. And she said, why don't you come to dinner? And before he could answer, the Monsignor comes in and the priest looks up and sees him and he scurries away. But there are so many opportunities for us to go and share the gospel. I hope all of you take advantage of that. We need to show people that we care for them by asking questions. Here are some of the questions that you can ask. What is the most important decision you face in this life? I mean, think about it. How much time do people spend on certain decisions, whether or not what's the best life insurance policy, What's the best house to buy? What's the best bank to invest in, stocks to invest in? They spend all this time doing research, but when it comes to where will you spend eternity, people just don't spend any time investigating. What is the greatest gift you've ever received? We go out on Christmas Eve where Catholics are in the season of giving and receiving gifts, and we simply ask them, what is the greatest gift you've ever received? Not one Catholic has ever said eternal life. Oh, they'll point to their children, to their cell phone, to their ring, to their watch. And we simply say, there's a greater gift than that. The gift of eternal life, to know that the moment you die, you'll be with the Lord forever. Where will you spend eternity? If you get our newsletter, that was the article we published in the last newsletter. You can visit the website and all the newsletters are archived. But I wrote that article because people said, you've got a DVD entitled, Where Will You Spend Eternity? Why don't you publish a gospel track with that title? So that gospel track will be coming out next month. And it's a, it's a great gospel track that you'll be able to ask that question. What is your authority for knowing truth? We talked about that last night. How would you describe the God that you worship? Why did Jesus have to die? The reason I love this question is it gets right to the gospel. Every sin that's ever been committed by every man and woman must be punished by a holy and righteous God, and the punishment is death. That's why Jesus had to die, and he died as a substitute for those who will trust in him. What's the greatest news you've ever heard? Interesting question. There's, a, there's greater news than that. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you ready to meet your creator? We were doing a three-day seminar in Porterville, California last month, and during our free time, we walked down the city, and there was a, a man a lot older than I was, and I don't know, something came over me. I walked up to him and I said, are you ready to meet your creator? He said, what? <laughs> I said, we don't have much more time. We're both very old. God doesn't promise anyone tomorrow. Are you ready to meet your creator? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, he's either going to be a merciful savior or he's going to be a sin avenging judge. But you will meet him one day. Are you prepared to meet him? What is God doing in your life? Another open-ended question. If you could ask God one question, what would it be? See, what you're doing is you're, show pe you're showing people you care for them by asking questions about them. Do you know the only way God will forgive your sins? Jesus began and ended his ministry with the command to repent. Mark 1.15, repent and believe the gospel. Luke 24, repentance shall be preached in my name for the forgiveness of sin. There's an acronym called FIRE that you might consider using. F-I-R-E, F stands for family. Ask questions about their family, their upbringing. I is for interest. Ask them about their interests, what they'd like to do in their spare time. And then R, ask them about their religious upbringing. Did you grow up in a church? And then E is for 
evangelize. Now that you know enough about them, you can focus in on the gospel and use all those answers to the questions to evangelize them. Here are some questions you can specifically ask Catholics. What are you trusting to get to heaven? When I ask Catholics, where will you spend eternity? Nine out of ten times they don't mention the name above all names. It's heartbreaking. And after they go on and on and on about what they're doing and what they need to do, I simply ask them, what about Jesus? Oh, yes, Jesus, yes. Well, we have to believe in him. Why didn't you mention his name? It's all about works righteousness. Here's a good one. How and when were you born again? Jesus said you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a term that Catholics are not familiar with, being born again, because it's all about sacramental regeneration. Are you trusting in what Christ has done or what you must do? Is purgatory necessary to purge away your sins? Why do priests continue on an altar what Jesus finished on the cross? What we're doing by asking these questions is challenging them in their unbelief. What you want to do is drive them to the scriptures so they'll find the answer to these questions. What does your church teach about salvation? My precious wife, we were out witnessing at a Catholic church and she had on a long skirt and she got so excited walking up to talk to a couple of Catholics sitting on a patio bench. And as she walked up to them, she stumbled on her dress and fell on her face. And <laughs> okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit. <laughs> but she did stumble. And this is the question she asked. She said, how does your church teach you have any hope of salvation? And she said, well, our church doesn't teach that. She said, well, you do go to this church, don't you? Yes. And your church doesn't teach you how to be saved? No. Isn't that amazing? Jane said, well, shouldn't every church teach you about life's most critical issue? What must I do to be saved? Well, we need to discipline ourselves to be spiritual doctors what do I mean by that? Well, Jesus said it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. So we need to give people their true diagnosis. What is their true diagnosis? They were conceived in sin and they were born with a fatal disease called sin. Then we need to share there is more bad news. There is no human cure. But the good news is there is a divine cure and it's available free for the asking because of a love story written in blood on a wooden cross 2,000 years ago. Everyone that has ever been born into this world outside of Jesus Christ inherited a fatal disease caused sin and it will end in death unless people take the cure. We need to be spiritual doctors. We need to give the true diagnosis. People do not know they inherited this fatal disease, and they will not be interested in a cure until you let them know. If you walked up to someone and said you dis discovered a cure for cancer and they didn't have cancer, they wouldn't be interested. But if you walk up to someone and let them know they've got a disease called sin that will end in death, unless you take the cure, then they will be interested. So when you witness, we need to address the primary problem, and that is sin. We need to avoid preaching and arguing. We need to have a balanced conversation. Jane and I played a lot of tennis. That was a mission field for us. After the match was over, we'd often spend time sharing the gospel. And sharing the gospel is a lot like a tennis match. 
you volley a question, you wait for the response. You volley a scripture, you wait for the reaction. Back and forth, back and forth, a balanced conversation. Remember, unbelievers don't want to be preached at. Have a balanced conversation. We need to define terms biblically. You've seen that Catholics have a different definition of justification. Catholics have a different definition of grace. Grace is what they must merit by their good works. Some will reject the gospel because it would mean their ancestors are not in heaven. Yeah, you probably have run into that. Are you telling me that my grandfather who died as a Roman Catholic is not going to be in heaven? How do you answer that? Well, I take him to Luke 16. There you have the rich man and Lazarus. What does the rich man want who's burning in the fires of hell? What does he want outside of a drop of water to quench his thirst? He wants a missionary to go tell his brothers the truth so they will not end up in this place of torment where he is. So no matter where your grandfather is, he would want you to know the truth. And then I encourage them. I say, look at the thief on the cross. He was a sinner all of his life. He was condemned to death. He was mocking Jesus initially as he hung on the cross next to him. And then I think what happened to the thief is the same thing that happened to Peter in Matthew 16. Remember, Jesus said, who do, you, who do men say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. I think the same thing happened to the thief. He was mocking Jesus. And then the father in heaven revealed to him who was dying next to him. He put his faith in Jesus. And Jesus said, today, you will be with me in paradise. So no matter where your grandfather is, he would want you to know the truth. And maybe he had the same experience that the thief on the cross did. But do not let this stand in the way of you coming to Jesus Christ. I shared with you important contrast. The Bible is what God says. Catholicism is what man says God says. Christianity is a relationship with God through his son, the only mediator. Catholicism is a religion that offers a false hope of becoming right with God. The gospel divides all of humanity into two different categories. What a contrast. Believers are alive in Christ. Unbelievers are spiritually dead. Believers are under God's grace. Unbelievers are under God's wrath. Believers are destined for heaven. Unbelievers are destined for hell. Believers are forgiven and justified. Unbelievers stand guilty and condemned before a righteous God. Believers are empowered by the Spirit. Unbelievers are controlled by the flesh. Believers are children of God. Unbelievers are enemies of God and also children of Satan. Believers are set free by Christ. Unbelievers are in bondage to sin. Believers are reconciled to God. Unbelievers are separated from God. Why would anyone who sees the description of who they are apart from Christ want to remain an unbeliever? This is where the good news must come in after the bad news is shared. I hope this has been beneficial for you to know how to witness effectively God's way to Roman Catholics. They need to know that they are lost, destined for hell. They need to confess that they are sinners before they are candidates for salvation. Kyle, what's next on the program? So we're going to do a talent show at this point. <laughs> He hasn't made you laugh once. I had to, you know, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, this, in truth, none of this is, is, is a laughing matter, right? We're, we're here to be equipped. We're so thankful for the information uh, that Mike has organized. And, and um, 
just praying that God will not only plant uh, seeds in our hearts of, of, of a desire to boldly share the faith that he has entrusted to us, but that the, uh, the material that Mike has shared with us will then help to, to come out of us in an organized manner. The, the, the word of God. Can you stand here for a minute? Sure. I need to redeem myself with my wife. <laughs> I wanted to share real quickly on our resource table, we have what are called gospel cards. And what I did is I put together the 12 most important words of the gospel. And you can see on the screen, it starts with God who created man perfect, but man fell into sin. And now he needs the Lord Jesus Christ, his work on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. And it's only by grace through faith and repentance that you can be saved and receive the righteousness of God by believing the truth. On the back of each one of these cards, you will find four bullet points defining and explaining what each word means. And so this is an opportunity, not only for you to go deeper into the gospel, but it's also a good evangelistic tool. We actually brought these to the State Fair of Texas, and we laid them out at the booth as people came by. We asked them to pick what they wanted to know more about as far as the gospel and their eternal destiny. The most common word they picked up was sin. They turned it over looking for a loophole because they knew they were sinners. But this is a great way to let the unbeliever control the conversation by picking up cards and reading the description of the word and asking them, is this what you understand the word to be? So it's a great opportunity to share with your children, your grandchildren, and a um, great opportunity to go deeper into the gospel. Amen. <clears throat> yeah, and, you know, I hope you can see that we're not trying to give you a, a system. We're trying to give you exposure to the word of God, which the Lord will bring to mind at the right time and in the right ways. These are just some helpful ways that have worked in the past and kind of some, some, some good mechanisms that you can use to get the conversation going. Um, great resources, so please be sure to see that table. What we're going to do at this point, it's 1131. Uh, we have one more teaching session and then a Q&A right after that, uh, after lunch. So we're going to try to wrap up lunch by 12.10. Okay, if we need a little bit longer, we'll go to 12.15. Um, but we've got sandwiches and chips and cookies and sodas and waters over in the, uh, the worship center lobby. Let me pray for us real quick. And then as we eat, if you, when you get your food, if you walk across the lobby uh, or the, the breezeway, you'll notice... Room 200, which is our children's area, is set up all with tables and chairs so you can eat inside, fellowship together. Let me pray for us, and then we'll, we'll get some lunch. Father, we're so thankful for your goodness and kindness, your faithfulness in giving us truth in your word that never changes, truth that is sufficient and authoritative and effective for evangelism, truth that saves uh, we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by your word alone. So may we uh, enrich our hearts and, tr and, and place our trust solely in Christ and in his revealed word um, as we express our concern and care for our Catholic friends and neighbors around us. Father, please bless our lunchtime and the rest of our afternoon. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, friends, we're going to get started again in just a moment, so... Everybody feeling a little bit more energized, a little blood sugar boost there? Good lunch, good fellowship, good conversations? Good. Robert, no, not so much? Sorry, whoever had lunch with Robert, you didn't do very good. Sorry. <laughs> All right, well, as I said, we have one more session uh, for the early afternoon, and then we're going to finish the day with a Q&A. So, um, that code had been going around. Uh, if you need access to that, let me know. I've got several questions lined up, so uh, when Mike is done, we'll, we'll probably just roll right into that Q&A so we can maximize our time. Uh, feel free, as I said, anytime if you need to stand up, stretch, use the restroom, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll roll through. We have a kind of a hard cutoff time in this room at 2 o'clock, uh, and if we need, we can then um, either fellowship on the patio. It's a pretty nice day out, actually or we can go back into room 200 uh, afterwards if we want to continue talking with Mike. So Mike, go ahead. Well, this becomes the toughest part of the day. All the 
blood is rushing to the stomach for digestion. So if you start napping, I may have to throw something at you. <laughs> but hopefully this will be interesting for you because we're going to look into the future. And I think we would all agree we're in the end times. What is the role of the Pope and his church in the end times? We can only speculate. The Lord may tarry another thousand years, but he may be knocking at the door any moment to come and take us home. So what will happen when the Lord returns and takes his church to heaven? We know that the only people remaining on the earth will be unbelievers. So as we look into God's prophetic word, the future is glorious for those who have been born again as new creatures in Christ, but it is terrifying for those who are held captive by religious deception. Their only hope is to abide in God's word and come to a knowledge of the truth so they can escape the snare of the devil that holds them captive to do his will. By the way, in our last will and testimony, we have the first page of our will has a rapture clause in case we are suddenly removed from this earth and disappeared. We want our family members who are left behind to read where we are and to give the scriptures that show what the what takes place when Jesus comes for his church. And then we give them access to all of our biblical books on our bookshelves. They can read and study them and hopefully come to a knowledge of the truth. But this message that we're going to look at is important for two reasons. Christians need to know about the aggressive agenda that the Roman Catholic Church has to unite all professing Christians under the power and influence of the papacy. We need to earnestly contend for the exclusivity of the gospel, the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. For Catholics, we need to urge them to come out from religious deception, from a religious system that has departed from the faith of the apostles and is headed down the wide road to destruction. So before we begin, um, if you're not aware already, this message may offend some. And that is because of the great deception and the great compromise that is prevalent in many churches today. This will continue to flourish. The Lord said that the sign of his return would be great deception on the earth. We know the apostasy that started 2,000 years ago will continue to increase as the day of our Lord approaches. What's happening today is we see there is a decline in discernment. And I'm sure all of you know the reason why. Churches like this are on the endangered species list. Very few churches are now faithfully preaching the whole counsel of God. When people in the pew are not getting a steady diet of God's word, they are not hearing truth. And when you don't hear truth, you cannot discern what is false. So we've had a decline in discernment because the word of God is not being faithfully preached in many churches. But at the same time, we see deception and apostasy increasing. So when we look at end times prophecy in Revelation 13, verses 7 and 8 and 11 to 12, we see that all who dwell on the earth will worship him, and that is the first beast, everyone whose name has not been written in the Lamb's book of life who has been slain. The false prophet, referred to as the second beast, causes the earth and all those who dwell in it to worship the false Christ. So this prophecy reveals that there will be two men who will be instrumental in creating a world religion that will indeed worship a counterfeit Christ. This will be the ultimate deception, Satan posing as God, Antichrist masquerading as the true Christ. Instead of a frontal assault on Christianity, the evil one will finish what he has been doing, and that is invading the church, planting his terrors from the outside to the inside. He knows that he can destroy the church more effectively by planting terrors in the church than by attacking it from the outside. So this should not, disguise, this, this should not surprise us because Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 11 to 
to 14, 14 and 15. So we can be sure that Antichrist will appear as the purest angel of light. And we already see the decline of discernment and people will be easily deceived. Just as many Roman Catholics are deceived by a false Christ today, there are many now who are being deceived about the apostate religions that are seeking to unite with her. We need to be aware of Satan's agenda. He's the master counterfeiter. Whatever the Lord creates or the Lord is, Satan comes along and creates a counterfeit. We see the Holy Trinity is made up of the Father who seeks worshipers in spirit and in truth. Satan seeks worshipers as God. He seeks worship as God through lying signs and wonders. And that's been his ultimate goal. That's what got him kicked out of heaven. He wanted to receive the worship that is due God alone. The Holy Trinity has the Son who rules as the King of Kings, and the unholy Trinity has Antichrist, who will rule as king, empowered by Satan. The Holy Trinity has the Holy Spirit, whose ministry is to glorify the Son of God, whereas the false prophet of the unholy Trinity glorifies Antichrist by causing all to worship him. So the Bible tells us the end times will be marked by a worldwide religious system that will worship a demon-possessed leader called Antichrist, the son of perdition, the man of sin. This will be Satan's final attempt to be exalted as the Most High God and receive the glory that he has desired from the beginning. And keep in mind the word anti and antichrist, it means in place of or opposed to. And that's very interesting because the Pope believes he is acting in the place of Christ. And in fact, that is a form of antichrist. So who is the false prophet? The Bible describes him as a religious leader who resembles a lamb, but speaks as a dragon. He has the power to make the earth's inhabitants worship Antichrist, and he kills all who refuse to worship the image. From Revelation 13, verses 12 to 16. Don't miss this. The false prophet will point the world to Antichrist and will kill all who refuse to worship the image. Has this ever happened before? Bishop J.C. Ryle said the Pope ordered many reformers burned to death because they denied the very body and blood of Jesus Christ was present in the Eucharist. So death was forced on all those who refused to worship the Eucharist. So we will see history repeating himself. Ryle went on to say that union with Rome would be an insult to our martyred reformers. The Roman Catholic Church has a horrendous history of torturing and murdering anyone who would not bow their knee to the Pope. During the Inquisition, they killed millions of quote-unquote heretics, most of which were born-again Christians. The Vatican has since changed its strategy for world dominion. It no longer can put to death those who will not bow their knee to the Pope. Now they're gaining the world by a new strategy called seduction. The papacy exalts itself above God and his word. Pope Francis steals all three titles given to the Holy Trinity. Holy Father, head of the church and vicar of Christ. He robs Christ of his power over all the souls. He usurps God's infallibility and he condemns all who refuse to believe. I'm sorry, he condemns all who believe God's gospel. We saw that from the Council of Trent, the anathemas imposed on all those who deny the sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ. Any pope who touts his own authority, boasts of his own holiness, and steals titles given to God alone, defies imagination. Yet so many are so deluded by this man. I think 
we would all, all agree the most wicked thing anyone could ever do would be to shut the gates of heaven to those who want to enter it with a false and fatal gospel. What did the reformers think of the papacy? Martin Luther said the Pope is the very Antichrist who has exalted himself above and opposed himself against Christ because he will not permit Christians to be saved without his power, to lie, to kill, and to destroy body and soul eternally. That is where the papal government really consists. Now keep in mind, keep in mind that Martin Luther knew the Pope very well. You know Martin Luther's story. He was a Roman Catholic priest. And so for him to make this description of the Pope is indeed something that we need to make note of. The papacy stands in direct opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ and his work and the gospel. It's no wonder the reformers called the papacy antichrist as one who claims to represent Christ but actually opposes him. Listen to the words of Charles Spurgeon. Popery is as much the masterpiece of Satan as the gospel is the masterpiece of God. It robs Christ of his glory because it puts sacramental efficacy in the place of his atonement and lifts a piece of bread into the place of the Savior. Where are the Spurgeons of today? Why are evangelical leaders embracing and applauding the Pope instead of warning their congregations about this false teacher. The papacy is viewed by Catholics as the spiritual bridge builder between God and man, the visible head and the high priest of the church. And Pope Francis is the high priest of Catholicism, which is why he wears the title Pontificus Maximus. He uses his Twitter account as at Pontificus. By the way, remember, that was Constantine's title as he began inviting pagans into the church through the baptismal font. No repentance was necessary. Pagan traditions crept into the church. So is Pope Francis indeed Holy Father, or is he a pawn of Satan? He has been one of the most controversial popes in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. He not only opposes God's word, but also historic Roman Catholicism. His deceptive lies are leading millions of people down the wide road to destruction. The Apostle Paul defined people like this in 2 Corinthians 11. Such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And that's what Pope Francis and all the bishops of the Catholic Church declare they are, apostles of Christ, successors of the apostles. The father of lies uses his false apostles to deceive the world. Like a deadly undetected cancer, these lies can spread quickly unless they are exposed and refuted by the supreme authority of God's word. If we truly love people, we must tell them the truth so that they can be aware of Satan's strategy to deceive the world. When you look at the last day's church, <clears throat> in 2 Timothy 3, 5, we see the church will have a form of godliness, but deny its power. The way of truth will be maligned and false teachers will revel in their deception. 2 Peter 2, verses 2 and 13. Jesus asked a very profound question. <clears throat> when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Luke 18, 8. The glorious gospel of Christ has been compromised by so many pastors that it's lost its power to save. Many in the church are false converts because they've never been called to repent and believe the gospel as it is gloriously revealed in scripture. There is a major seminary graduating students who become pastors denying that repentance is necessary for salvation, producing many false converts, professors of Christ who are not possessors of Christ. 
What will be the role of the Roman Catholic Church in the last days? Well, it's got a well-defined strategy to unite the world under the power and influence of the Pope. The Vatican boasts of being the headquarters of God's kingdom on earth. It has great wealth, great power, and worldly influence throughout every nation and country in the world. Keep in mind, its great wealth came from selling the forgiveness of God through indulgences. Traditional Catholicism has always strived for complete religious control of the entire planet. No longer able to torture and murder its opponents, it has developed a new strategy of seduction rather than force. Is Jack still here? Yes, the Jesuit agenda. <clears throat> Since its beginning in the 16th century, the Jesuits have been establishing a kingdom for their pope. During the Inquisition, they ordered countless millions murdered and are now calling separated brethren back home to Rome. We need to understand the Jesuit agenda today because we have the very first pope who is a Jesuit. If we're to understand the ecumenical agenda of this current pope, we need to know about the Jesuits. Their goal was to eliminate any opposition to the pontiff. The Jesuits today they're very strategic in what they've accomplished in 500 years. Most notably, they have built many Roman Catholic schools, colleges, universities, and hospitals, and then do that for the purpose of spreading Roman Catholic propaganda, Roman Catholic deceit and deception, and the false and fatal gospel of the Roman Catholic religion. They're indoctrinating many people through these different venues. The Eucharist is a non-negotiable sign of unity. Vatican Council II in 1965 declared this, all Christians will be gathered in a common celebration in the Eucharist into the unity of the one and only church. This unity subsists in the Catholic Church as something she can never lose. This is the calling card of the Roman Catholic Church to bring all separate all separated brethren back home to Rome for the fullness of salvation. So many times I hear of Protestants departing from their churches to join the Roman Catholic Church because one or two Roman Catholic apologists have convinced them they cannot have the fullness of salvation until they return home to Rome for the Eucharist. I shared this with you earlier, so I won't do it again, but the priest believes he has the power to call the Lord Jesus Christ down from heaven and change the inner substance into his physical body and blood, soul and divinity. So when we look at the Vatican's attempt to bring all Christians under the Pope, it really started with a degree, decree on ecumenism at Vatican Council II in 1965. Since then, we had evangelicals and Catholics together. These started in 1994. You may remember it was Chuck Colson and Richard John Newhouse who came together and drafted the first evangelicals and Catholics together accord. After that, there were subsequent accords in 1997. And then you had Catholics and Lutherans coming together signing an accord on the Joint Declaration of Justification. Can you imagine Lutherans signing a decree on justification after you saw the contrast between Roman Catholic justification and biblical justification? What would Martin Luther think of that today? But that's not all. In 2002, you had Catholics and evangelicals coming together in conversation at Wheaton College, once a bastion for conservative Christianity. And more recently, you had the Manhattan Declaration, signed in 2009. Each one of these accords brings together more and more leading evangelical pastors, seminary heads, all coming together, daring to say that we share a common faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
The decree on ecumenism in 1964 opened the door for Rome's ecumenical outreach to Protestants by appealing to them as separated brethren rather than condemning them as heretics. Yet Rome still condemns all who believe justification is by faith alone. So as the Vatican continues to seduce Protestants with its push for unity, we must make our voices heard for the glory of our Savior and the sanctity of his church. When Chuck Colson first got together with Richard John Newhouse to create this unity accord, I sent him a letter asking him how there could be unity when Galatians 1, 6 to 9 condemns the Roman Catholic clergy for distorting the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Roman Catholic Church condemns evangelicals over 100 times with its anathemas from the Council of Trent. How can there be unity when there's condemnation coming from both sides? And I got an answer from him, but it was a form letter. He didn't address the issue. But we need to make our voices heard. We need to call evangelical leaders to account. Many of them may be either ignorant or many of them may be trying to gain a wider appeal of people, having more influence, more power. And so they're compromising the gospel, calling for unity with apostate religions. John MacArthur has always spoke very clearly, renouncing unity accords. He said in the long war on the truth, the most formidable, relentless, and deceptive enemy has been Roman Catholicism. It is an apostate, corrupt, heretical, false Christianity. It's a front for the kingdom of Satan. Where would we be today without the voice of John MacArthur? What courage, what boldness to stand against all opposition and declare the truth. We need more evangelical leaders taking the same position today. Well, the Bible speaks of two kinds of unity. There is biblical unity, and this is a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. It's not a work of man. It demonstrates a common faith in the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we read that we are baptized by one spirit into one body. Then there's also religious unity, and this is a work of Satan who uses man's prideful ambitions and biblical ignorance to unite the world. In one sense, we see that the religious Tower of Babel is now being rebuilt, the coming global religion that will one day worship Antichrist. True unity is in the body of Christ. All members are one, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Pope Francis says everyone is a child of God, once again showing his biblical ignorance. He said despite the differing beliefs, everyone is a child of the same God. Many think differently or seek God in different ways, but there is only one certainty. We are all children of God. Many who do not know the Bible are being deceived by the Pope's pronouncement that many can seek God in different ways. The Pope's assertion directly opposes God's word. No one seeks for God. We see that in Romans 3.11. But there are many who seek after false gods of their own imagination or their own religious traditions. The only way to come to the true God is his way through his one mediator, and that is the God-man, Christ Jesus. Furthermore, we are not all children of God. The words of John in 1 John 3.10, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Listen to the words of the Lord Jesus as he was rebuking the apostate religious leaders. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. When the apostate Jewish leaders refused to believe the truth of God's word, Jesus said their father was the devil. Everyone 
is a child of the devil until they exchange their religion for a relationship with the one true God through Jesus Christ. Only then are they adopted into God's family as his adopted children. According to God's word, only those who receive Jesus by believing in his name become children of God. And we see that in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Like Satan, the Pope does not stand for truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and he deceives the world. But we need to say what the truth really is. This man is the most influential false prophet in the world today. Did you know the Pope canonized an agnostic unbeliever? Her name, of course, is Mother Teresa. At the end of her life, Mother Teresa doubted the existence of God in heaven. In her private letters, she wrote, Lord, my God, you have thrown me away as unwanted and unloved. I call, I cling, I want. There is no one to answer. No, no, not one. I have no faith. Yet in spite of Mother Teresa's lack of faith and her rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this unbelieving agnostic was declared a saint by Pope Francis. I don't know if you've read much about Mother Teresa. She had millions in the bank, but she refused to, move, to use the money to minister to the poor. They had very dire living conditions but Mother Teresa was under the impression that people could expiate their own sin by suffering, and so she refused to help them with all the money that she had in the bank. Here's the words of Pope Francis. The Lord has redeemed all of us, all of us with the blood of Christ, all of us, not just Catholics, everyone, even atheists. You see here the Pope is a universalist. He's even said there is no hell. And the Pope has signed unity accords with Muslims. Here you see a picture of the Pope and the Grand Inman of Al-Azhar. Together they signed a historic declaration calling for peace between nations, religions, and races. Together they stood hand in hand in a symbol of interfaith brotherhood. The Grand Imam, considered to be the most important man in Sunni Islam, greeted Pope Francis. Together they're working to unite Islam into part of the new world religion. By the way, if you're not aware of it, paragraph 841 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church declares that Muslims are part of God's plan of salvation. I hope you recognize that Roman Catholicism has more in common with Islam than it does with biblical Christianity. I did a whole message showing 10 common bonds between Islam and Roman Catholicism. They both are pushing for world dominion. They both believe in a works righteousness salvation. They're both anti-Semitic. They both esteem Mary as the most revered woman who's ever lived. They both look to apparitions of Mary as a means to unite the world together. They both have their prayer beads. The Catholics have their rosaries. Muslims have 99 beads with the names of Allah. None of the names, by the way, refer to him as a personal God. They both take pilgrimages to obtain favor from God. At the turn of the century, Pope Francis invited Roman Catholics to go through the wooden door of the Vatican to obtain a plenary indulgence. And as you know, that's one of the five pillars of the Muslim faith to participate in pilgrimages as well. So we really can see the genesis of this coming one world religion as these religions are coming together, common bonds of unity. And I really believe, as the Bible says, lying signs and wonders will deceive the world, and I believe apparitions of Mary will be instrumental 
She's coming for all of her children. She dares to say that no one could be saved unless they're devoted to my sacred heart, denying the gospel of Christ. Did you know there's a worship center that's opening up in Abu Dhabi? It is a place where all the monotheistic religions can come together and worship their God. It's called the Abrahamic Family House. It'll be a communal place of worship with a synagogue, a church, and a mosque in a single complex. More than ever, we're seeing a convergence of the major world religions as they, as they seek common bonds of unity. Here you see Pope Francis, very popular among homosexuals. He was named Person of the Year by the homosexual magazine, The Advocate. He says that gays and atheists will be saved. God's mercy has no limits if you go to him with a sincere and contrite heart. The issue for those who do not believe in God is to obey their conscience. A universalist. Even though the Bible describes homosexuality as a sin, the Pope doesn't call for repentance. He just says that they will be part of God's plan of salvation. The Pope knows that if he appears to be humble and tolerant of all homosexuals and atheists, he will be loved by more people. What did Jesus say? Woe to the man who is loved by all. It would be good for this Pope to hear the words of Christ. That's what he gave in Luke 6.26. Did you know the Pope praised an abortionist? Pope Francis praised Italy's leading proponent of abortion, Emma Bonino, as one of the nation's forgotten greats. Bonino worked with an abortion clinic that boasted of over 10,000 abortions. Pro-life leaders in Italy expressed disbelief and probably even unbelief that the Pope would honor her. Where's the outrage from Roman Catholics today? When are Catholics going to say enough is enough? How many more lies and ungodly statements are they going to tolerate from this false prophet who is leading people down the wide road to destruction? It seems every week the Pope comes out with another bombshell that goes against Catholic teaching in the inspired word of God. By the way, my wife and I often go out to abortion mills and we're very concerned about two different lives that we would like to protect. And one, of course, is the physical life of the baby in the womb. But also, when you go out to abortion mills, you're going to see that evangelicals are outnumbered by Roman Catholics. So we're concerned also about the spiritual life of Roman Catholics who are protesting at abortion mills. We make the opportunity to share the gospel with them as they are praying their rosary and trying to stop women from having an abortion. We were up in Portland, Oregon, I guess it was four years ago maybe, there was the solar eclipse and we had a great vantage point there in Portland, but one of the things that we did while we were ministering there for four days is to go out to an abortion mill. And I was standing there protesting and sharing the gospel with a John 14, 6 sign. And as I was standing there in the street, there is a person in a Jeep that gunned his Jeep and came right after me. And fortunately, I was able to see it in time to step out of the street onto the curb and avoid being run over. One of the people with us was videotaping this on his cell phone. And so when the police came, he was able to share the video and the license plate of the person that tried to run me over. The police soon arrested him within 15 minutes and they came back and said, you can press charges if you'd like. We have arrested him. And I said, do I have to come back to Portland? He said, yes, if you're going to press charges, I said, we'll just let him go then. That is the most spiritually dark place in the country. Wow. And that's, of course, where the light of the gospel needs to shine brighter. It is really heartbreaking to see. But more than ever, I think we need to make the most of every opportunity. 
it really is a shame that more evangelicals are not protesting at abortion clinics. I don't know if um, you saw the movie, what was the name of it? Unplanned, does that ring a bell? It was about an abortion clinic in College Station, home of the Texas A&M Aggies and through the film, you can see that many evangelicals were praying for the abortion clinic to be closed, and it actually was the highest number of abortions being produced in America, and through the power of prayer, that abortion mill was shut down. And just recently, I guess it was about a year ago, we also found out that the abortion mill in Portland was also shut down. I don't know if that's part of your prayer life, but more than ever, we need to ask the Sovereign Lord to put an end to abortion in our country. So hopefully you will include that in your prayers. Did you know the Pope seeks to ban the death penalty? He said all Christians and men of goodwill are called on to work for the, aboli for the abolition of the death penalty. Once again, we shows the Pope and his unwillingness to submit to biblical authority. Even before the Mosaic law was given, God established and ordered capital punishment upon any man who took another man's life unlawfully. You see that in Genesis 9, 6. And then you've got the Pope demanding global authority. He's trying to convince the world that our only hope for peace, prosperity, and a planetary salvation is for nations to surrender their sovereignty to a global government. During a recent speech, Pope Francis advocated a policy of decreased national sovereignty and increased global unity, claiming that planetary problems are exacerbated by an excessive demand for sovereignty on the part of all the states. I don't know who is the bigger liar, as you see on this screen, but both of them together are really trying to do away with national sovereignty. The World Health Organization now is trying to take away our sovereignty in health care. Pope Biden, of course, is pushing for that. Is, did I say Pope Biden? <laughs> President Biden? <laughs> yeah. Well, here you see the wooden door I think I spoke of earlier. Pope Francis opened the holy door in St. Peter's Basilica to offer plenary indulgences for the remission of punishment for sins. Those who pass through the door will receive the indulgence. So the Pope is very interesting. Rather than pointing people to the living door, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, he points them to a wooden door to receive a plenary indulgence, the remission of all the punishment due for their sins. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John 10, verses 9 to 11. The eternal sin debt was canceled when the perfect high priest offered himself the perfect sacrifice to a holy God who demands perfection. Then Jesus cried out, it is finished, no more offerings for sin, because by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Well, the fields are indeed white for harvest, the Pope's bizarre teachings have left many Catholics unsure about who they can trust. They are seeking an authority they can trust. You and I need to take advantage of this opportunity to point them to the only one that will never mislead them or deceive them, point them to the infallible inspired word of God that is absolute truth. I'm telling you, Catholics are up in the air right now as to where to find truth. They know they cannot trust this Pope, even though he declares himself to be infallible. They've seen him go against historic Roman Catholicism. More than ever, let's take advantage of this. 
point them to Christ and his word. Rome has a very good strategy for Christian unity, and it's working very well. What they're doing is they're redefining evangelical terms to make them ambiguous, vague, and acceptable to all. If you have nothing else to do, you can pick up the unity accords and you can see this vague, ambiguous language. There was great wordsmithing going on to try and get people to sign a unity accord that really means nothing. Another strategy, beguile and confuse Protestants with Catholic mystics and contemplative spirituality. This strategy has been very effective. They urge separated brethren to come home to Holy Mother the Church for the fullness of salvation. And this strategy is very appalling. They're seducing highly visible evangelicals to promote Roman Catholicism as a valid expression of Christianity. Tragically, this is working very well. I want to share with you just a couple of instances. Here you see Rick Warren. He calls Pope Francis our Pope. He said, I really do feel that these people, Catholics, are brothers and sisters in God's family. I'm looking to build bridges within the Roman Catholic Church. You may know that his purpose-driven life was also edited to give to Roman Catholics. And by the way, I don't know if you ever looked at it, but Rick Warren presented a gospel, and it was void of three different R's, the most common R's that are left out of the gospel presentation, and that would be he left out the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he left out the righteousness of God, and he left out repentance. But yet in his gospel, he said, if you have believed this, welcome to the family of God, repeat this prayer and you're in. How many millions of false converts do you think came into the church because of the purpose-driven life? He is indeed a false teacher. And then you've got Louis Palau. He said Pope Francis is a very Bible-centered and Jesus Christ-centered man. He's really centered on the pure gospel. He is a friend of evangelicals. Now, this is very disturbing because Louis Palau and I used to do conferences together. He was very well aware that Roman Catholics needed the gospel. He took our Spanish tracts down to South America to distribute among Roman Catholics there. But because he is from Argentina, as is Pope Francis, he now says Pope Francis is a Jesus Christ-centered man. How can he say that? when you've seen all the statements Pope Francis has made. But can you see why evangelicals are confused about the Roman Catholic religion? Robert Jeffers, pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas. When Pope Francis, I'm sorry, when Pope Benedict resigned, he said on a television program, the Pope was a wonderful, dedicated Christian man, and we celebrate the ministry he's had. Now, you probably have heard of Robert Jeffers and seen him on Fox News. Fox News is dominated by Roman Catholic reporters. Robert Jeffers was the go-to pastor. So when I heard this on the TV broadcast, I immediately emailed Pastor Jeffers. We've done conferences together. I asked him how you could tell people to celebrate the ministry of a false prophet who shut the gates of heaven to those who wanted to enter with a false and fatal gospel. He wrote back and he said, Mike, whenever I'm on TV, I cannot bash Catholicism. And I wrote back and said, Robert, that wasn't what I asked. I said you could have done one of three things. You could have told the truth, which you chose not to do, you could have remained neutral, which you chose not to do, or you could have deceived your audience by saying Pope Benedict was a wonderful, dedicated Christian man and celebrate the ministry he's had, the ministry of proclaiming a false and fatal gospel. 
And then you have Al Mohler, <clears throat> the president of Southern Baptist Seminary. He said Pope Benedict was one of the most brilliant theological minds of our times. He said this in an interview with a Roman Catholic bishop. I actually copied the link and put it in one of my newsletters because I wanted everybody to hear the very words of Al Mohler saying this. How can you celebrate the ministry of Pope Benedict and call him one of the most brilliant theological minds of our times? This is a false prophet. This, one, this is one who distorts theology, who has a different Jesus, who has a different gospel, who's led by a different spirit. But yet, once again, the Roman Catholic Church applauds people like Al Mohler because what he's done, he's putting a stamp of approval on Roman Catholicism as a valid expression of Christianity. Moeller is saying this about the man responsible for the new catechism of the Catholic Church. I don't know if you're aware, but Pope Benedict was the author of the new catechism of the Catholic Church before he became Pope. And so he's the doctrinal guru of the Catholic religion. The catechism of the Catholic Church, you've heard me quote different paragraphs. It goes directly against the word of God and the gospel of Christ. So he's actually praising a pope who's under divine condemnation for preaching a false and fatal gospel. There are some evangelical pastors that say the Reformation was a mistake. Another pastor of a large church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I'm sad to say he's also a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary. When Pope John Paul II passed away, he made this statement in a magazine that went out throughout the 3,000 members of his church. The rift that occurred between Catholics and Protestants 500 years ago is theological pettiness. In other words, the reformers and the martyrs who died for the gospel of Jesus Christ, who, who were burned at the stake, who, were suffer, who suffered and were tortured, they died for theological pettiness, according to this evangelical pastor. He goes on to say, we'll have plenty of time in heaven to figure out who was right about purgatory and Mary. John Paul was a man of God whom all Christians should admire, thank, and emulate. This is heartbreaking. When this came out on the magazine, I immediately contacted the church and I asked if I could come in and set the record straight and talk about what the Roman Catholic Church teaches its people. But they said, no, Mike, we know all about your ministry, and you're not welcome here at Irving Bible Church. So we've seen the Pope, who was once called Antichrist by the Reformers, he's now referred to as a brother in Christ, a survey by a 1,000 senior pastors from Lifeway Research declared that almost two-thirds of evangelical pastors say Pope Francis is their brother in Christ. More than one-third say they value the Pope's view on theology and that he has improved their view of the Catholic Church. It's just so hard to believe, isn't it? I mean, you have sat here and you've heard all the distortions of the gospel Everything the Roman Catholic stands for goes against the inspired word of God. But this is why we receive so much friendly fire from evangelical pastors. These stunning statistics are the tragic result of the unity accords that have been signed by highly visible, highly influential evangelical leaders. Most evangelicals do not know if the Roman Catholic Church represents a huge mission field or if it is an apostate denomination that needs to be evangelized. By God's grace, we will continue to stand boldly for the truth, to make his truth known, and we will continue to receive friendly fire from evangelicals. I must tell you that 
it's rare that uh, we are invited into evangelical churches anymore. Very few are standing for the truth of God's gospel. Very few are standing on the truth of God's word. So many churches have now compromised, and many of them are embracing Roman Catholicism. So those who promote unity with false teachers without challenging their ears leave their own convictions and beliefs open to question. We may all be accountable for the souls who are misled by our unwillingness to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. We need to defend the glory and honor of our great God and Savior. There's a popular bumper sticker you may have seen. If you know Jesus, you will know peace. And when there is no Jesus, there is no peace. The Holy Spirit inspired me to come up with a correlation. If you know doctrine, you're going to know division. And when there is no doctrine, there is no division. And that's what all the ecumenically minded evangelical leaders want to do today. Let's suppress doctrinal truth for the sake of unity. Let's all come together and sing Kumbaya. I don't know if you remember Promise Keepers. That was one of their six promises. Let's suppress doctrinal truth that divides us. Let's all come together. Well, I hope you would all agree that divine division and truth is infinitely better than satanic unity and error. Well, by now I hope you can see that Catholics and Christians are divided on the essentials of the gospel. We're divided on how one is born again. Rome says it's the efficacious waters of baptism. The Bible says it's the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. You've seen how we're divided on justification. Rome says it's faith plus works. The Bible says it's faith alone. We're divided on how one is purified of sin. Rome says the fire is a purgatory. The Bible says the precious blood of Jesus. We're divided on who mediates between God and man. Rome has many different mediators, whether it be Mary or the priest or the saints. The Bible says there is one, the man Christ Jesus. We're divided on the sufficiency and the necessity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And ultimately, we're divided on the path to paradise. We need to be reminded of 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 17. The Apostle Paul writes, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. Note the five vivid contrasts. Righteousness with lawlessness, light with darkness, Christ with Belial, a believer with an unbeliever, the temple of God with idols. Do not be unequally yoked. Separate from them. We cannot have unity with unbelievers. There are two paths to eternity. We've looked at that. And remember this diagram, these two paths to eternity are available in our red gospel track. It's a great opportunity for you to sit down with a Catholic and they will agree they're on the Roman Catholic path to eternity. Show them the narrow path that leads to life where there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So as we close this afternoon, some questions to ponder. How many people in your circle of influence even know that you're a Christian? What about where you work, where you go to school? your neighborhood? How many people know you're a Christian? How many people have you engaged with the gospel of Jesus Christ? How many of you engaged in a spiritual conversation? My wife and I just moved to the South Lake area to be close to our church. We moved across the Metroplex five and a half years ago. One of the first things we did in our new neighborhood of 38 homes we conducted an evangelical Bible study. We invited neighbors over to our house. 
We started with the supreme authority of God's word. Then we went into the gospel. Then we went into the assurance of salvation. We chose five different couples. One couple was a Muslim. One couple were Muslims. One couple was former Catholics that are now unchurched. Another couple goes to Gateway Church. And another church, another couple were professing Christians that did not go to church. What a combination of people. But through all of this, we were able to share the gospel and get to know our neighbors. I'll never forget a retired American airline pilot who was a former Catholic and no longer goes to church. After the fourth evening, I looked at him and I said, what is keeping you from trusting Jesus Christ as your all-sufficient Savior right now? You've heard the truth from God's word. You've heard the gospel. What's keeping you? He said, you know, Mike, I just need more information. Which was, I guess, an honest answer, but that was four and a half years ago. Gave him a copy of my book, Preparing for Eternity. There's been no movement. But you know, God's the one that gives the increase. We're successful every time we share the gospel. You know what's really interesting? The only one that we saw conversion, or at least professing conversion, was the Muslim woman. And one of the things I shared during the Bible study, I said, I'm not saying this to offend you, but did you know that your Quran does not predict the future? And the Bible does. Do you know why the Quran does not predict the future? She said, no. I said, because the God of Islam does not know the future. The God of Islam is not sovereign over all the events of the world. But the Bible, when it was written, it contains 30% prophecy of end time events. The reason the Bible can predict the future is because the Bible is the inspired word of a sovereign God that controls all events and knows the future. He knows the end from the beginning. Later on, when she professed Christ, she said that was the one thing that caused her to start reading the Bible. She wanted to know the future. She wanted to know the God of the Bible. So how are you doing with the Lord's last command? Is it your great commission or your great omission? And I, I know the fact that all of you are here this weekend. You have a desire to be better equipped, to be faithful to the Great Commission. And I really hope and pray this has been beneficial to all of you. May God give you the courage, the boldness, the faithfulness to sow the seed of his imperishable word wherever you go. We do not know where the fertile soil is, but there's a promise by the Lord when the fertile soil receives the seed of God's word, it will produce life. So that's the encouragement that we all have. We don't know where the fertile soil is. That's why we need to sow it wherever we go. So thank you for the opportunity to share a great burden that I have with my wife, Jane. We lived it, as many of you did, for many years of your life. There's no greater passion that we have than for the truth of God's word and no greater compassion we have than for those who are deceived and don't even know it. So thank you. We've got some time for questions and answers. 45 minutes it looks like. Thank you all for taking a shorter lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, Mike, thank you for equipping us well. Um, guys, this is, this is the joy of being part of a like-minded brotherhood of churches and, and, and uh, ministry partners that men like Mike will be willing to come here and open up the word and show us truth. So we're really grateful for that. Well, through the Q&A or, or QR code for the Q&A, we got about 30 questions. So we're going to do a rapid fire. No, we're going to, we'll, we'll go through these and we're going to kind of see how far we get. If we can't get to all of them, I apologize. Um, but I actually wanted to start with a question that Pastor John wanted to address. And we really want to kind of hit this point home because um, 
in our context in this valley, this is something that many Christians in, are facing and many churches are capitulating to. Uh, I wanted to have you elaborate as much as possible on what is the John 17 movement? Is it an attempt by the Pope to assimilate Protestants back into Catholicism? And why is it so attractive to so many evangelical churches? Well, sure, the John 17 mo movement actually started in your area in Phoenix. And it is another ecumenical attempt to unite Roman Catholics with evangelicals. And it's all based on the high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ in John 17. And when you look at how the Lord prayed, he wanted unity in the truth. So it's impossible to have unity with Roman Catholics who do not share the truth of God's word or the truth of the gospel. But Roman Catholics don't look at that. They just see that Christ is calling for unity among all professing Christians. And so we need to make sure when people are encouraging you to be a part of the John 17 movement, that they know that we are sanctified by the truth. You and I have been called out of this world a people for God's own possession because we have believed the truth of the gospel and the truth of his word. Roman Catholics have rejected the gospel. They've rejected the authority of God's word. They're unbelievers, and so we cannot be unequally yoked with Roman Catholics in this John 17 movement. But as you have seen from this last message, the ecumenical movement is gathering steam. Pope Francis is the most aggressive pope we've had in recent years pushing forward the ecumenical bandwagon. And he's been very successful with his call for universal salvation among all peoples. He's um, pretty much done away with the gospel and said, there is no hell. All people go to heaven. Let's just all come together. Yeah, um, another common question that I think is it comes in people's minds when we talk about something that you mentioned, that all Roman Catholics have rejected the gospel. Uh, like Martin Luther, do you believe it's possible for a Catholic to be born again and still continue in their Catholic faith? You know, Martin Luther got saved reading the word. Uh, he left the church. Erasmus tried to stay in and reform. But do you believe it's possible for a Catholic to be born again and still continue in their Catholic faith? Side question, are there such a thing as reformed Catholic churches? If a Roman Catholic is born again, he's no longer a Roman Catholic. He has renounced his Catholic faith. That's why the command of our Lord Jesus is to repent and believe the gospel. You have to change your mind about the false way you once believed and believe the true way, which is the gospel of Christ. A Roman Catholic who hears the gospel will hear it from outside the church. A Roman Catholic will never hear the gospel inside the church. There are no more Reformed Catholic churches. Maybe 500 years ago when the Reformers were rising up, you remember Martin Luther didn't want to leave the Catholic church. He wanted to reform it. Mm. But eventually the Catholic church will dismiss you and ask you to leave if you're proclaiming the truth of God's word. So the answer to the question, a Roman Catholic Christian is an oxymoron. Yes, there are born-again Christians in the Catholic Church, but they're no longer Roman Catholic. They're now born-again Christians. They've renounced their Catholic faith and believe the Christian faith, the Christian gospel. So they'd be in process of being saved out of and away from. Yeah, a healthy and, Christian would grow away from that. And Kyle, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Great Commission is to go and make disciples. It's not to go and make decisions. Mm -hmm. Disciple-making is to teach them to observe everything Christ has commanded. And God seeks worshipers in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. So a born-again Christian cannot continue to worship God in the Catholic Church because it's full of idolatry and it's a false religion. This question, um, I think we'll clarify a little bit. Does the liturgy cover the entire Bible or just the parts that justify the Roman Catholic tradition? So I think... Uh, is what is taught through on a regular basis. Do, do they hide and knowingly and openly hide Scripture? Yeah, the Catholic Church will say they go through the entire Bible every three years, but I don't believe that. In my experience in 35 years, I never heard Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 from the Catholic pulpit. And by the way, um, 
the Catholic Church emulates the evangelical church. They now have their own study Bible. When it first came out, I was so excited. I wanted to go and see the study notes for Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Guess what? There are no study notes. <laughs> it's almost like they don't want you to notice this. Let's just keep going on. So yes, I believe they purposely withhold some of the truths that set Catholics free. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned something a little while ago about some anti-Semitism inside of various Abrahamic religions. Uh, some of the pushback with Catholics is against Luther. And so the question is, how do we explain Luther's anti-Semitism to Catholics? And is Luther's anti-Semitism a real argument? Well, you got to remember, the Roman Catholic Church was anti-Semitic, and that's where Luther came from. He was a priest in the Roman Catholic Church. And so he brought some of that Catholic baggage with him into his salvation experience. And so, yes, uh, when you read Luther's writings, he was anti-Semitic. But, of course, that has nothing to do with the gospel. Also, the Roman Catholics um, also taught a position of eschatology called amillennialism. And so all the reformers, they addressed soteriology and justification but they did not address eschatology. And so many of the reformers carried their amillennialism into their salvation experience. And that's why you see many neo-reform people today upholding the amill position. It's because they traced their eschatology back to the reformers rather than tracing it all the way back to Christ and the apostles. Absolutely. Um, the Evangelical Sisterhood of Mary has sisters devoted to prayer and worship. The question is, I believe there are false, there's false doctrine involved in this ministry. I feel a call to a prayer ministry. How do I use my uh, desire and call to prayer for God's glory and within the church with right doctrine without feeling the need to become a sister? Hmm. Well, that's an important question because... Whenever you are praying with unbelievers, I hope that you never address God as Father because unbelievers have a different Father. Satan is their Father. And so when you pray with an unbeliever, I usually address God as Sovereign Lord or Almighty God, but I never refer to Him as Father when I'm in mixed company with unbelievers. You also have to realize that these sisters are probably praying the rosary and the Bible, of course, uh, denounces repetitious prayers. We see in Matthew 6, the Lord said, don't pray like the pagans with their repetitious words. We also want to exhort Roman Catholics to look into the scriptures and find one God-fearing man that prays to anyone other than God. You won't find anyone. And so the prayers need to be addressed to God, not to anyone else. Okay, so the answer would be, uh, every Christian is called to prayer, called mm -hmm. to a ministry of prayer, and we do so according to the prescription of Scripture, which is categories of doctrinal truth and adoration and praise That's right. done from a heart of worship. Right. Confession and thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is an interesting historical one. Do you think when Constantine introduced paganism into the Christian church that he gave Satan a foothold and the cancer spread? Well, Sure. As I mentioned earlier, Satan offered the Lord Jesus the world if he would bow down and worship Satan, and Jesus fulfilled his ministry by rejecting the offer. But when the world was offered to Constantine as the Pontificus Maximus of the, at that time, beginning of the Roman Catholic Church, he accepted the world, he invited the world in, and it did give Satan a foothold, not only with unbelievers coming into the church, but they came in with all their pagan traditions and practices. And so they departed from the word of God as their authority and started following pagan traditions. And so many of the traditions that you see in the Catholic Church today are the pagan traditions that crept in, including transubstantiation. Mm -hmm. uh, That's a good question. Um, this question says, I've met some Catholics in Mexico who pray to or worship the Virgin of Guadalupe. Is this another title for the Virgin Mary, or is this something different? Yeah, the Virgin Mary in the Catholic Church has more titles than the Lord Jesus. In fact, if you look at churches with Roman Catholic theology, 
you will find more churches named after Mary and the saints than named after Jesus Christ. So yes, uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe is just another name for Mary. She's got so many different names. I should probably do an article on that, all the different names Catholics attribute to Mary. And so that one culturally was a local manifestation, as right. you had talked about before. Yeah. As the apparitions. Okay. This question says, I have many Catholic relatives on the East Coast who I mainly interact with on social media. Most seem to be Catholic in name only or not overtly religious, but some post about praying to Mary, praying the rosary, etc. Can you suggest ways I can respond in a way that is loving yet points out that this is not biblical? Sure. Well, one of the things we encourage, in fact, oftentimes we see um, Roman Catholics, very few, but some, will encourage separated brethren to come back home and they'll give a book by a Roman Catholic apologist defending the Catholic faith. So this is an opportunity for you to give them a book and say, why don't you read the book I'm going to give you? I'll read the book you're going to give me, and then we'll get together and we'll discuss the two books. And so we've had so many Roman Catholics set free from religious deception by reading Preparing for Eternity, because it, it forces them to make a decision. Should I trust Christ in his word or the teachings and traditions of my religion? They cannot believe both. And so that was one way to do it. Another way would be, you know, if there's one message that I would have you share with your Roman Catholic loved ones, it would be the first message this morning, and that is the sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have Catholics, say, on the East Coast, why don't you send them the link of the message this morning and ask them, do you believe that Jesus Christ is sufficient to save you completely and forever? If not, then maybe you could watch this video, and then we can discuss it later. Wonderful. He's not just trying to sell books, by the way. These are, the, these are collections of resources that will help to give you direct answers to people who don't even know the questions to ask. So we want to honor his work in that, and, and we're grateful for that. Uh, and remember, the resources. Spanish book is available free. All you have to do is send us your email address. We will send you the PDF, and you can spread it through all the Spanish-speaking people you know. Yeah, these resources simply help to continue the work of the ministry. Uh, and I'm sure we'll find ways as well to be able to connect with you and support your ministry in other ways. Uh, later. Um, do you think it is a good idea to read the Roman Catholic Catechism to better equip believers for evangelism? This is, I think this is a good question. Yeah, and you don't have to do that because what I did in my red gospel track, it's a 16 panel fold out. If you haven't seen it yet, I would encourage you to at least get one copy. But that's what I did. I took the Roman Catholic Bible and I took the Roman Catholic Catechism, and point by point on the doctrines of Jesus and the doctrines of salvation, I share with you what the Catholic Bible says right alongside what the Catholic Catechism says. So you have the paragraph numbers there, and it forces a Catholic to choose between Christ and his word or their catechism. And by the way, there's actually a search engine available on the internet where you can actually click on the paragraph of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and you can read these particular paragraph numbers. The newsletter that's coming out June 1st, I'm contrasting biblical justification with Roman Catholic justification, and I'm giving all the hot links to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So as you read the newsletter, you simply click on the paragraph number. It takes you right to the Catechism. So. You don't have to read the whole catechism, just um, get a copy of this and you'll know more than most Catholics. All right, so this, this question says, I have a homosexual uncle who sings in the choir at his Roman Catholic church. His partner was the organ player at the, at the time at the same church. The priest accepts them and welcomes them to dinner, or he did. When the partner was dying a year ago, the priest came for communion and offering last rites. How do I begin to address this at all in conversation? By asking questions. Do you know what God's word says about homosexuality? Do you know that God requires repentance in order to be saved? Turning from sin and false teaching 
to believe Christ and his word? Yeah, there's a, a lot of different directions you can go with that. It's a very sensitive subject, of course, and as you've seen from the last message, Pope Francis is friend to homosexuals, and um, there's several books written by Roman Catholic priests who are homosexuals, and they said that uh, over half the priesthood is homosexual. It's an opportunity for homosexuals to go and have status in the community and hide their sin. Um, for the life of me, I can't understand why Roman Catholic parents can allow their sons and daughters to be altar servers and be with a Roman Catholic priest who obviously have no sexual morals. But um, yeah, I think we need to address it as sin and say that Jesus Christ is the one who came to save us from our sin. You know, we, we talk so often about Jesus saving us from the punishment of sin, but he also saves us from the power of sin. And ultimately, he will save us from the presence of sin. So many homosexuals hate their lifestyle, but they have no power to overcome sin until they come to Christ and they have the indwelling Holy Spirit that gives them an opportunity to say no to sin and to live a righteous life. Yeah, Mike, I think two of the things you said earlier were so helpful uh, in a situation like this, asking a lot of good questions mm -hmm. in those categories about uh, religious understanding or background. And of course, with family, you, you know many of those things already. Uh, ha having the boldness to not fear man, especially family, but mm -hmm. to, to represent Christ. And, and when Romans 10, 9 says, if we confess with our mouth that Christ is Lord, uh, this is an expression that our entire life is a testimony of Christ's lordship, that we, that we follow him as our sovereign, as our king, and, and we obey his command to share the gospel in every situation. If uh, I could just say one other thing. Um, you may remember, I don't know how many years ago now, but um, the Roman Catholic Church was having to pay out lots of money for the sexual abuse of priests. And uh, all the bishops gathered in Dallas, Texas at the Fairmont Hotel. And I went down there to engage Roman Catholic bishops as they came out from the hotel. And I remember it was a hot August afternoon, 100 degrees, and, you know, I would engage Roman Catholic priests, and, and um, many of them were open to having conversation with me, but there was one conversation I had that I'll never forget. There was a woman there who had a son that was an altar boy, abused by a priest. He was 13 years old, and he couldn't handle it anymore. He committed suicide. And so she shared that with me, and I said... I would want to point you to the perfect high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will never forsake you, never leave you. He will protect you. And she said, you know what? I was born a Catholic, and I'm going to die a Catholic. Even though she lost her son to the perversion of the Roman Catholic religion, she was unwilling to let go of her Roman Catholic belief. It's just heartbreaking, the power of indoctrination. Guys, this is an important ministry. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I stated at the very beginning of the class yesterday, equip these classes exist uh, to fulfill Ephesians 4.11, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So I hope this is all hitting home and helping you to understand. Uh, Mike is out not just teaching this, but living this. We were at lunch yesterday, and he engaged in two conversations with people serving our table while we were sitting there. Uh, and this is a mentality I think that our church can grow in dramatically and, and do wonderful, wonderful work. And Kyle, if I could just accentuate that. When the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, he fulfilled his ministry to seek and to save that which was lost. And before he ascended into heaven, he passed the baton to the church. The reason we are still here, the reason we're not taken to heaven the moment we're born again is because Christ has given us the awesome responsibility and the royal privilege to be his ambassador to take his message throughout the world, beginning in our Jerusalem and going out. So that is our mission here. The reason we're still here is to share the message of the gospel. Royal privilege mm -hmm. is the shift in our perspective that will help to remove, I think, not only the fear of men, but mm -hmm. uh, the 
absence of desire to go out and evangelize. It is a royal privilege of the family of God to, to, to be bannermen for the king, to share his gospel and his message. One of our members asks, I sit on a prison ministry board of directors, which has 25% Roman Catholics. I'd like to witness to them uh, per this seminar. Is there a good path to do this without to totally turning them off from my fellowship with them? Begin by asking questions. <laughs> yes. How does your church teach you have any hope of going to heaven? Mm. What are you trusting in for eternal life? Mm. Do you have eternal life or conditional life? Do you have the assurance 1 John 5.13 says to those who believe in the name of the Son of God that you can know that you have eternal life. Is that something you know? These are just great questions, and most Catholics don't know about the assurance of eternal life. And so 1 John 5.13 is a great place to point to. That's wonderful, yeah. Engaging in dialogue, knowing that we're not another religion um, shilling ideas and promises, oh, if you come with us, you get this. But we have the words of eternal life. We have the mm -hmm. only source of eternal life. And so we have an upper hand in the game already. And we don't have to win the game. We simply have to testify faithfully, and the Lord will do the rest. So that's, that's, that's great. Um, okay, so this question, sort of related to the class, but an interesting one. There's a judgment that is stated at the end of the world in Revelation 20. However, the judgment is for, um, this is for everyone who does not believe in Jesus, including those people who've already died and those who still live. But what about judgment for Christians? Is there a judgment for Christians that is different than that that we see in Revelation 20? It says, please help me to understand uh, and clear some doubt in my mind. Yeah, there's no judgment for Christians. Our sin has already been judged at Calvary's cross. There is the Bema Seat of Christ where we will receive the rewards for what we've done in Christ. And, of course, when we get our crowns, we will give them right back to the rightful owner, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is living through us. Yeah, but we don't want to be in heaven with no crowns. We want to be able to give <laughs> yes. them back to Christ to yeah, be so faithful. That, that judgment, for, for those of you who don't understand the, the term Bema, is this idea of a, of a rewards ceremony, an award ceremony. It's not a judgment of morality at this point. It's, a, it's like when an athlete finishes a race and they're judged to see what place they came in, you know, for the sake of rewards. So some people, uh, adding to the, 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 the answer to the question, what are we still doing here? Uh, our mission is to evangelize and, and, and propagate the kingdom on behalf of Christ. While our king is gone, we are ambassadors for him. Um, but to what end? We're all saved already. Aren't we saved already? Well, there's these uh, measures of faithfulness that we see, and the Bema Seat will, will uh, expose those for us, you know, whether or not our life was used for faithfulness. The only judgment, in a sense, there is that some people will suffer loss seeing the wasted life where they did not testify well or serve the Lord well. Um, but yes, no judgment in the sense of damnation because that has been dealt with According to Colossians 2, Christ nailing our certificate of debt to the cross. Another way to put this, as unbelievers, God was our judge. As Christians, God is our loving father. Amen. He's no longer our judge. He's now our loving father. We will never be judged for our sin because they were all paid for by Christ. Well, that's a nugget of good news you can share with people right there. Mm -hmm. that's a, if that doesn't like raise your spirits a little bit just in the seat right there, I don't know what will Okay, back to um, a question specifically related to Roman Catholicism regarding the sacrifice of Christ in, in the Eucharist. If the Eucharist, this is kind of a confusing one, but we'll, we'll work through it. There's a syllogism in here. If the Eucharist is unbloody, how does it follow that uh, it is supposed to, that we follow the command of Christ to eat his flesh and drink his blood? Where's the blood? Also, regarding the wine, is that supposed to be changed into Christ's physical blood? And if so, how does it make the sacrifice unbloody? You know, it's a good question. That's I've, a good question. <laughs> I, I've actually asked Roman Catholic priests that, yeah. and they say we just don't have an answer for that. But the wine does turn into the blood of Christ, according to Catholic theology. 
But also in the Eucharist, it contains the physical body and blood of Christ. So you wonder, why do you need the wine if the blood's in the Eucharist? You know, when you make up your own religion, you have a lot of inconsistencies that cannot be explained. And so a lot of times you have priests scratching their heads and saying, we just don't have an answer for that. But we want to challenge them in their unbelief. And you ask them these questions and see them squirm and try and come up with an answer. But there is no rhyme or reason for it. Well, and as you say, as you, if you invent it as you go, the doctrine of transubstantiation is, is an invention of man's mind that sort of kind of fills the gap and makes it a spiritual yet physical yet spiritual reality, which mm-hmm. is not a reality at all. Right. But uh, inconsistencies proven by looking at the word of God and seeing, oh, that's nowhere to be found. So then what do we do? Do we continue to believe a tradition or do we trust the all-sufficient word of God? Mm-hmm. This is a good one, a Bible study question. I recently heard a women's Bible study teacher say that Christians are too hard on Catholics because they carried the early church for us. How do you respond? Mm. That's a terrible Bible study leader. Yes, really. (laughs) Well, it's tragic because uh, some of the evangelical Bible studies have actually had Catholics as leaders, and that's very discouraging because how can they lead an evangelical Bible study when they don't have the truth? But um, I mean, the historical question of did the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church carry the evangelicals in the early church? As they so often claim, we have the faith going all the way back to the apostles. Well, you guys showed up later. Yeah, you look at the book of Acts and... Believers were first called Christians. They weren't called Catholics. So, you know, it really comes down to when did the Roman Catholic Church find its start? And you cannot trace any of its traditions back prior to the 4th century. You had baptismal regeneration in 400. Then you had the sacrifice of the Mass in 500. So you see the genesis of the Catholic Church in the 4th and 5th century Prior to that, you had the body of Christ made up of born-again Christians. Now, we also see apostasy taking place in 1 John 2.19. So there is two streams of Christianity, apostate Christianity and true apostolic Christianity. But you don't see the origin of the Catholic Church until the 4th or 5th century. So the answer to that question, no, the Catholic Church did not carry evangelicals early on. And we did not get the Bible from the Catholic Church. We got it directly from God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amen. It's bad information. That person is misinformed. Mm-hmm. Not the question, person who asked the question, but the Bible yeah. study leader. <laughs> Just want to clarify. I don't want you to feel bad in the room here. Um, this is a question, kind of a syncretistic question from our um, uh, Latin American friends. Santeria, or the Way of the Saints, is taking over a lot of Central American and South, uh, South American uh, communities uh, with a lot of influence. What can be done in some ways to reach out to them with evangelism, especially during those ceremonial times of the year? Well, that's a good question because when you look at the genesis of evangelicals and Catholics together in 1994, it all started because the Catholic Church was losing a lot of its people to evangelical Christianity in Brazil and South America. And so it's almost like the Catholic Church said, let's declare peace. (laughs) We won't proselytize you if you don't proselytize us. And so that was the beginning of evangelicals and Catholics together. And so um, there's been a heavy influence of Roman Catholicism throughout Central and South America. We've had the opportunity to go down to Honduras through the Master's Academy International and I've been there four times, and pastors from all over Central and South America come into Honduras for a week, and they sit under the teaching of um, what you've heard over the last five messages, and they know better how to reach Roman Catholics in Central and South America. But unless you know a lot about how the Catholic Church opposes the gospel and opposes God's word, then you're really at a loss as to how to reach them. You really have to challenge them in their unbelief by knowing a little bit about Catholicism so that you can address those issues with the truth of God's word. So would you probably give us the same advice for 
these experiences like Santeria or uh, Day of the Dead or even sure. where, you know, my wife is from down in Mobile area, the mm -hmm. um, Mardi Gras, these kind right. of practices that, that fold in um, uh, secular ritual into uh, the practice of Catholicism, would you, would you say boiling it down to asking questions sure. and finding out about background and culture and why mm -hmm. it's being expressed and what trust and hope people are placing in those things. Yes. In fact, when a person comes up with one of these bar, bizarre um, ideas that you just named, I just simply ask them, what is your source for truth? Where did you come up with this? Is your source for truth reliable? Is it questionable? How do you know whether or not this is true? So what if the answer is, well, you know, it's just a cultural practice. Yeah, it's kind of connected to my faith, but this is just what we do as a family and as a city and a community to come together. Yeah, how do you know that Satan is not the influence of that particular tradition or practice? After all, Satan is the god of this world, and he's a master deceiver, and a he's a liar, and um, he tries to blur the gospel with a lot of pagan traditions and Stuff like you talked about. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's that's. See how quick that answer was. That's what we all need to be good at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's being able to turn around and give a quick response. Yeah, uh, and often calling people back to biblical faithfulness. Sure, Kyle. And oftentimes, um, if a person asks you a question and you don't know the answer, say, "Can I get your phone number, or email, and I'll research that in the Bible and I'll get back to you with what God's Word says about that." Another good question, what should we do uh, after asking a Catholic to show us in the Bible where a particular Catholic doctrine can be found? They point to apocryphal texts. How should we practically and concisely refute the apocrypha as being canon? Well, and I mentioned that earlier, but you'll see that um, the, the Jews never had it as part of their Old Testament. Most of the writings of the apocryphal books came during the intertestament period. God was silent 400 years before Christ, and that was the close of the Old Testament. And then you had the Intertestament period, and that's when these apocryphal writings came forth. But what you can do is you can show that there's historical, geographical, and theological errors in the apocryphal books, which is why it never was part of the canon, because God's word is perfect without error. So they cannot be considered part of the canon. Another resource would be um, Pastor John about a year and a half ago and about five years before that, preached a message called uh, How We Can Trust the Bible. Um, and it's a very, very well-researched and concise uh, defense of the biblical canon. So you can go back on our YouTube page and find that, listen through that, and arm yourself on how we actually got the Bible because we'll be told a lot of lies about how we got the Bible. And most of them are anecdotal postcard statements that people accept because they want to reject the Bible anyway. So once they hear truth about it and know that you can defend it, they won't be as easily able to get away with that. This person asks, so if I'm understanding correctly, all Catholics go to purgatory before entering heaven, even priests or bishops? Even holy fathers. Well, the tri it's a trick question. The answer is no, none of them go to purgatory. <laughs> But in their understanding, in their yes, understanding even, yes, even popes in their understanding end up in purgatory for a couple million years before going to heaven, right? Yeah, and this is the amazing way that the Catholic Church controls its people, not only in this life, but in the next life. If you ask a priest, how many masses must be offered to get our loved one out of purgatory? They say they don't know, so keep on purchasing mass cards. And then you ask, how many years do they have to spend in purgatory for a certain kind of sin. By the way, when I was a young altar boy, they actually had a list of all the years that you would spend in purgatory based on each sin. Mm -hmm. Well, they've since done away with that. Now the priest just says we don't know how many years, but you'd have to keep paying for masses in order to get your loved one out. And as I mentioned, John Paul II, when he died, eight cardinals came in to offer the sacrifice of the mass to get the Holy Father out of purgatory. And this is what's uh, truly sad for those who are devout Roman Catholics is they, they may very well die and wake up in hell thinking, well, I'll get out one day. 
Yeah, wouldn't you know, that be the... Uh, I hope people are praying for me and I'll get out one day. Well, wouldn't that be the father of lies? Greatest deception is to put up a sign in hell that says purgatory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, an endless hope that one day they'll get out. Mm-hmm. So follow-up question. Uh, and I, you did mention this earlier, but just so that we can clarify our thoughts, where, where does the evidence for purgatory come from in the Apocrypha? Well, there is no evidence of purgatory. It's that, the anecdotal statement from Second well, Maccabees. Second Maccabees, the, during the Maccabean revolt, some of the Jewish soldiers died with pagan amulets around their neck, which is idolatry, by the way, and a mortal sin. <laughs> but yet they sent alms back to Jerusalem for the repose of their souls. And so the Catholic Church read that and said, ah, here we go, we've got credibility for the existence of venial sins, purgatory, and indulgences. And so they grabbed the apocryphal books and placed that in their canon at the Council of Trent for the purpose of giving credence to the idea of purgatory. And I mentioned uh, you know, the three lies of the Catholic Church that are all interconnected, venial sins that do not cause death, indulgences that remit temporal punishment. There's no temporal punishment for sin, it's eternal punishment. And then you have purgatory, which is a temporary suffering in the fires to remove temporal punishment. So those three lies, venial sin, purgatory, and indulgences are all connected. And it's the continuation of the lie of the devil in the garden. You surely shall not die if you break God's command. Wow, that's a great way to put that. Mm -hmm. Interesting question. This may be happening in, in, I don't know, individual practice or in, in various kind of uh, uh, softer uh, ref, uh, Roman Catholic denominations, how would you respond to a Catholic who claims they believe in the finished work of Christ on the cross and believe the, the practice of Mass is simply a liturgical, symbolic remembrance of Christ's sacrifice? Well, because if you look at the definition of the Mass in the Catholic Catechism, is it, it's a pr- propitiatory sacrifice. And it's not a memorial, which is what the Last Supper was all about. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He did not say, sacrifice my body in the form of a Eucharist until I return. And by the way, if Christ is physically present in the Eucharist, why are you remembering him? See the inconsistency? If he's present, then why did Jesus say, remember me? And so it's a memorial, but the Catholic Church has an altar because they deny that Jesus finished the work on the cross. And it's not only the Catholics, the Anglicans and the Orthodox have it as well. They they all have their sacerdotal priesthood, which can never take away sins, which is why the Mass is repetitious. It continues to offer Christ physical body and blood, soul and divinity as a propitiatory sacrifice were by stating that the wrath of God is turned away from the sinners who committed sins during the previous week. So we really need to show Catholics what it means. It is finished. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, what a, uh, that was a a very shocking uh, demonstration in the slides that uh, the, 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 the practice of the Eucharist, the Mass, the re-sacrificing of Christ, where a priest could at will demand Christ to come down from heaven and be re-sacrificed. Not only is that one of the worst sacrilegious you know, practices that I could imagine, but it denies the efficacy of the atonement, the it is finished, the Christ dying once for all, the just for the unjust, and is now seated at the right hand of God. Um, And don't miss this. It says that it is a power greater than that of angels. mm. The priest has the power to call the omnipotent God back down from heaven. Mm. What blasphemy. Absolutely. So if anyone invites you to a a mass to say, oh, just come to church with me, uh, realize it's not just another denomination and another expression of going to church. It is an idolatrous sacrifice. Uh, And this is why it's so important for Christians to understand a clear difference between biblical Christianity and Roman Catholic expressions of a pseudo-Christianity, because we don't want to lull them or ourselves into a false sense of a secure eternity. 
So it's important to ask these questions. This is a good one. When, in a conversation with Roman Catholics, does self-righteousness have a meaning particular to Roman Catholicism? Well, sure. Every Roman Catholic believes they must become righteous in order to be justified in the end. So they're constantly doing more and more good works to become righteous. They are infused with more righteousness as they receive the sacraments. And so ultimately they hope for a final justification. They become righteous enough to enter into heaven. Um, can you give a, a, an example of a mortal sin versus a venial sin? Well, once again, once the Lord saved me, I was curious, so I called the local priest and I said, so when does a venial sin become mortal? When does it cross that border? And he said, well, it really depends on whether or not you think it's mortal. And I said, well, let me give you an example. If I steal a sports shirt from a department store, would you say that's a venial sin? He said, well, sure, you're not affecting the bottom line of the store that much. So then I said, what if I steal a suit of clothes? He said, well, now you're getting closer to mortal. I said, two suits of clothes? He said, I really can't tell you where it crosses the line. That's up to you to determine. And all of you that grew up Catholic, didn't we rationalize? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah I mean, it, surely it's not serious enough to be considered mortal. But they do say things like mortar, um, murder. Yeah, if you kill somebody. Yeah, that, that's a mortal sin. Adultery would be mortal sin. Um, yeah. But you can run right to confession and clear it off, and you better do so before you die. How many Catholics realize the best time to be taken away through death is the moment you walk out of the confessional box on a Friday night? <laughs> <laughs> because you know the next day you're going to be sinning again, and those sins won't be forgiven until you go to confession Confess again. Confess at midnight, go right to bed. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Are indulgences for the dead only or for the living as well? For bo both for the living and the dead, sure. It reduces temporal punishment. And again, I'm going to tell you from practical experience, when I was in college, I was um, powerless to overcome my sin. So the only thing I could do was go to Mass every day during Lent. I looked at God as a God that judged on the scale. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to build up enough indulgences in this life so that when I go to purgatory, I'll get out more quickly. And so I looked at trying to have more good works on the scale than I had sin. And so in a sense, it was a license to continue to sin. As long as I was getting indulgences and doing the best I could, then that was compensating for all the sin in my life. But I can tell you, and we talk briefly about this, I would go to the priest and confess the same sins week after week. Little did I know at the time I was powerless to do anything about my sin because I didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit. I had no power to live a victorious life in Christ. Catholics claim that Luther took seven books out of the canon. The response being, they didn't have a canon until Trent? That's right. Yeah, the, the Catholic Church did not add the Apocrypha to the canon until Trent. So Luther didn't take anything out. They were never in. Now, let me say this. In the Latin Vulgate, written by Jerome, they had the Apocrypha there, but it was in a section called non-canonical books. So it was part of the Bible, but it was not canonical until the Council of Trent. Gotcha. Finally, we'll, we'll end with this question. Just I think this is a good theological end for our uh, discussion and speaking with people. How do you identify in a conversation if somebody is expressing, uh, it, it, we're talking here about repentance, but I'm going to say uh, a Catholic terminology of biblical truth versus real biblical truth. Grace, forgiveness, repentance, sorrow, all of those things. Yeah, you may not know, but that's where penance came from in the Catholic religion. They transliterated the word repentance into penance. And so that's why Catholics have to do penance before their sins are forgiven. And oftentimes that's in the form of repeating repetitious prayers, the Hail Marys and the Our Fathers. So you have to do that in order to do penance and have your sins forgiven. And so um, 
we know that repentance is, the Greek word is metanoia. You're changing your mind, and that produces a change in direction. You're changing your mind from a false way to a true way. You're doing a 180. You're running from Christ. And then the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin. God grants you repentance. And instead of running toward your sin, you now run toward Christ as the Savior who forgives you. So it's repentance and faith is the only response to the gospel. And that's what we need to call people to. We haven't talked about this, but um, I may be stepping on some toes. But there is no sinner's prayer in the Bible other than the publican who is convicted by the Holy Spirit of his sin. He cried out to the Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the only sinner's prayer in the New Testament. Nobody had to lead him in the prayer. He was burdened by his sin and called out to God. And so when I give the gospel and I see a person leaning forward and I I see an interest and they're asking questions, I will ask them, are you ready to trust Christ as your all-sufficient Savior? And you'll hear them say, well, what do I need to do? And take them to the word. Take them to Mark 1.15. You must repent and believe the gospel. And then take them to Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart. Yes, and then you take them to verse 13. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If a person's drowning in the ocean, you don't have to tell them, holler help before someone will come. (laughs) You will do that because you are desperate. And when you're convicted of your sin, you will cry out to the Lord. And we've heard some of the most beautiful prayers when people call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. Well, Mike, thank you so much. I think we can see from the, the, uh, the beginning of this class to the end uh, that if we are well armed with biblical truth, accurately presented in the way that God would have us present it, Uh, in the situation, that is the best way for us to be armed for evangelism. Mm -hmm. And you've given us some very uh, helpful tools and resources to, uh, to, when we find ourselves in situations, these these, uh, tracts and and the DVDs, uh, the books as well. Please, if you haven't taken advantage of those, go back to the resource table. Um, Let's give Mike a round of applause. Thank you so much Mm -hmm. for being here with us. And can I just, I want to thank all of you. You've given up your weekend, Memorial Day weekend at that. to come. Did any of you know it was Memorial Day weekend? You're like, what? (laughs) (laughs) To be equipped and encouraged. And I just want you to know that hopefully this is just the beginning of a relationship that we have with all of you. We're no more than a phone call or an email away. And I can tell you, we answer all of our phone calls. We answer all of our emails. We're here to help you and encourage you in any way we can. So please let us know if we can be a source of encouragement for you because you've indeed been a source of encouragement for us. Thank you, brother. Well, Mm -hmm. we are grateful that you have uh, stuck around, stuck with us for this whole class. I know it's a lot to ask to come to a course like this, but hopefully you have found it uh, enriching and and that God will bless you for the sacrifice of time and efforts to be here. So thankful for that. The band and the, the, the crew needs to come in and get ready for our 4 o'clock service. So if we could, we'll move outside onto the patio. We can go into the lobby of the worship center as well if you want to talk to Mike, look at the resources more, and we'll look forward to seeing you at church this weekend. Thank you all.